I want to um, invite you guys to do things a little differently today than perhaps normally you do in one of these lectures. And I want to encourage you to actually, wherever you are, uh, to take your phone out and to have it on <laughs> and to have it readily accessible, if you have a smartphone especially, because um, I would like to encourage you today to use your technological superpowers, which that's basically what those are, for good. And I, I have intentionally, uh, I have a presentation that is very academically rich, however, it is not academically traditional. And so I'm not going to have a lot of slides full of outlines. Instead, um, my slides and my PowerPoints are all intended for you to be able to take screenshots or take photos and text them to who you think needs to see them. Um, the way in which I try to create a global community within my own talks is in uh, or is by encouraging people to tweet at the Twitter handle that you'll see here. Um, and, and get the conversation started in that way as well. I also want to encourage you, more than taking notes today, anything that you hear, I can send to you or you can find online easily. I can, I can reference it and you can find online. Um, more, more than the notes that you will take or the pieces of data you will record, I would love for us to have a shared experience today. Because the more of our lives are, that are lived in digital spaces, the less we have experiences with each other in embodied spaces. And so even if we are sharing this space over the you know, World Wide Web and we are all over the world, we can have an experience together just by kind of sharing the information that we are learning today. The next thing I want to say is that my, my slides uh, also are going to be a little bit um, different in that sometimes when I am talking about very scholarly research, which I um, am having a hard time making, maybe I'm pointing it wrong, Vance, am I pointing it wrong? There we go, thank you. Um, I, I spend 15 hours a week now, so I'm a psychologist, I'm in private practice. A little bit of about why I got interested in this topic is that I have a 22-year-old and a nearly 20-year-old, and their favorite toys when they were growing up and my favorite toys with them were toys where we would all lay on the floor and play together, right? Um, suddenly, when about 10, hour, 10, hour, 10 years after my kids uh, were born, I had a niece and nephew, and I wanted to gift them with some of the same kinds of toys that I had had and that my kids had had. And what I found when I started shopping for toys is that most of the preschool toys at that point, which was about 10 years ago, were beginning to have computer chips in them. So they lit up, they made sounds, um, you know, there was, no, there was no sense of play in the same way that there used to be. Um, and so I began to become interested about that time in how this um, kind of trending down in technological advances to younger and younger children were going to impact the lifespan of these kids and especially their relational attachments and the way in which they develop a sense of self. From there, I began to read research and uh, talk about this and then kind of immerse myself in the world of pop culture. So up to, up to you know, about, I don't know, three months ago at least, I dedicate at least 15 hours a week reading research and uh, doing really horrifically mundane things like reading People magazine and <laughs> trying to keep up with what's happening in our culture and where we are spending our time. The research that I'm going to talk about today, if we looked at the articles, looks a lot like this. This is a piece of research that, that has to do with video game play and impulse control um, and agitation. However, this isn't very exciting to look at, so sometimes I'm going to show you the USA Today version or the New York Times version. However, you can be sure that whatever research I bring up is quality research. It is well constructed, it is peer reviewed, and um, there are very good reasons to kind of consider that it would have something important for us to know about. Um, I want to also just tell you about what brings me to this point today. And maybe you can help. Am I pointing this incorrectly? Vance, Vance, who's the king of all things, is going to help me. Um, so I've been doing this research for 10 years. In the last three months, I have had a lot of changes. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, in how I think about technology, even though this is my topic, this is what I immerse myself in. But in the last several months, I've had some unique experiences. So I've had a couple of experiences of doing grand rounds with physicians, internal medicine doctors, uh, pediatric doctors, and family practice docs. I have also had the opportunity to do several different state um, psychiatric and psychological association plenary and keynote addresses. And I have not been in rooms of people ever in the last maybe two years uh, of people who are less aware of what is happening in digital spaces than these rooms full of therapists and physicians, largely because they are busy doing therapy and practicing medicine. <laughs> However, 
We are now living in a time where the bulk of our world culture is spending amounts of time that are unbelievable to many of us in digital spaces, and the people who are helping to care for those folks aren't aware. And I, I think that's really important, that we need to, we have a responsibility to be aware of what's going on. The other thing that happened in the last three months was I had an eye exam, and as soon as my eye doctor found out uh, you know, what I did for a living and what I was speaking on around the country, she was flooding me with information about some of the physiological effects. This also happened when I was with the residents. There are now profound physiological effects that we are beginning to see come forth as a result of our high attachment to screens and our high involvement in digital spaces. I also spent a time at a high school called Sandy High School within the last two months where I uh, spoke with 1,800 high school students. <laughs> It was quite a two days, 45 minute uh, assemblies over and over with about 200 students each. But it gave me this opportunity to be with young adults and adolescents in a way that was deeply profound. In that same amount of time, I've been on six different college campuses across the US that has given me an opportunity to kind of understand what's happening now for the young adult kind of mind, body, and self. And I bring that information to you today because most of you are busy doing other things than talking with high school and college age students at this kind of rate about this topic. Similarly, and the last thing that happened for me in the last three months was that I saw the movie The Duff. Any of you seen, at least here, seen the movie The Duff? It's currently in theaters. Duff stands for Designated Ugly Fat Friend. And it's a fantastically pitifully sad but realistic picture of how uh, culture today is really being dominated, especially for children, for adolescents, and for young adults by what happens in digital spaces. So all of that I bring to you today, and I want to, to help you kind of become immersed in a world where students feel like home is a little bit like this, right? Home is a little bit like sepia Kansas. We all, you know, you love home where it's warm and safe and, and parents and teachers kind of want to bring kids up and bring in Kansas, right? And the kids are constantly trying to figure out how can they get to Oz because Oz looks like this and Kansas looks like this. And there's a reason <laughs> that we want to, ex to kind of escape to these digital spaces that are so colorful and bright and beautiful. And as a result of this, you'll find in a lot of the um, kind of the academic research, a lot of the pop culture research, cultural anthropology, anthropological research, and futurists are talking about IRL, which they are using this acronym to stand for in real life, right? My problem is that I don't believe that there is any more a real life and a digital life. I believe that we are spending so much time in digital spaces that our real lives include our digital lives and that they really are kind of merged in a unique ways, and, and, or in some unique ways. And especially for young adults and adolescents, um, their digital lives are very much their real lives and we need to be aware of that. Oftentimes, as, especially as psychological professionals, we kind of come at, the, at them as though we need to tame them, you know? And I especially find folks who don't use technology a lot or who are not as aware of what technology delivers these days we'll kind of talk about wanting to come in and, and tame these digital natives as though we need to, you know, revert back to phones with cords that are hooked to walls. And, and we can't romanticize, we can't do that. The technology is here, it's here to stay. It's fantastic. It allows for a place like Cal Southern to exist. It has amazing things that it can deliver to us. However, it's also maybe not what we were born for. And culture is more than happy to now tell us that it is what we were born for. In fact, we see things like this all over the place.
right? So, so this generation really of kids and young adults is told, you were born for the internet, you were born for digital devices. And what I find is that there's this huge divide uh, between folks who have really adapted to and who are using technology a lot and folks who aren't. And there's this sense that we kind of, the older generations have given the younger generations these amazing tools, this, this technology that is just mind-bogglingly, overwhelmingly fantastic. And then we have resented them for using it. Right? So we give it to them, we give them the capacity to turn their whole world into digital kind of wonderland. And then when they do so, we're mad at them. We haven't taught them anything. We haven't taught them how to be moderate. We haven't taught them how to be safe. But we instead resent them. And if you, if you look at some of the literature, and, and especially some of the media, pop media, you will hear this, the generation kind of under 30 being referred to as the crappiest generation of all time, the most entitled, low-life nobodies. I'm sure you guys have heard this. This is how we refer to them. And yet, we are the ones, largely my generation and up, are the ones who have given this. So what I feel like I would like to help us all do is learn how to become qualified navigators and guides. We need to know what's happening in these spaces. And then we need to be able to inform the people who are spending time there about what some of the outcomes are and what some of the research is showing us so that we can make wise choices. So the first thing we need to know is you guys need to know the lay of the land in Oz. Why do people want to leave Kansas for Oz? And I will tell you kind of what the lay of the land in Oz is right now. So one of the places that we can find the best information about what's happening in technological circles is at the Consumer Electronics Showcase Fair in Las Vegas every January. Some of you probably follow it. And um, these are the traits that really came out from this year's uh, conference and also just in looking at what is happening with app development, with web development, um, with kind of even hardware uh, development. More and more space that are digitally kind of um, inhabited are wanting to be ephemeral, meaning that, that developers are wanting the communication that happens in digital spaces to disappear over time, to look more like the kinds of communication that happens between embodied people. There's no record of a conversation that you and I have when we have it embodied person to embodied person. And so uh, tech developers are wanting to make our digital experiences more like that. They are also wanting these experiences to be hyperdynamic, meaning they are constantly Changing. They're hyper-connected. We can get access to more and more people in really dynamic ways. Humanity is now kind of considered your credential. You know, and, and what I mean by that is that in the past, if you had a medical condition or if you had uh, something going on, you would go to a person who had credentials to help you with that, right? You would pro or even if that was a parent, like, oh, this person's given a lot of Band-Aids and treated a lot of boo-boos, you know? Um, but you would go to a physician. Now, typically, the first action that people take is to Google something, right? Um, and, and whoever comes up in the first five search hits is going to be the expert. We see this in also, well, we're, I'll show you in how we see it, but, um, but humanity is a huge issue because we also, at the same time, are not teaching digital literacy or media literacy. So people don't know how to kind of evaluate what they're finding online. So you put those two together and there, there are some real issues going on. Um, we want our experiences in digital spaces to be more shareable. We want them to have this far-reaching, large impact. We want them to be non-age segregated and more accessible to more people. We want them unmoderated, meaning there's nobody kind of controlling the, the, the connection. The, 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 the experience there is kind of um, feels hyper-real almost and hyper-present. And then the final thing that is really coming through in the tech world is the gamification of most things. Um, in mental health in the US now, many insurance companies are increasingly moving to a gamified model where if I, as a private practitioner, uh, submit a clinical diagnosis of anxiety or depression for someone, very likely their insurance company is going to send them weekly games that can help them with their, their, their symptoms that they will do online. Um, this is happening in schools across the United States for sure, where many, many districts and schools are moving to a one-to-one -one policy where uh, first graders, sixth graders, and ninth graders will be given iPads that will serve as their homeroom instructors. And so we are seeing the gamification of learning more and more, not always with the end in mind of actually creating dynamic learners, but more with the, with the end in mind of making learning fun. Um, so we're gonna, and we're going to talk about that as we go. These are just examples of some of the ways in which those trends are playing out. These are three of the more accessed social networks. 
Tumblr is also very interesting as, as a kind of a connector of people. This is one of the spaces that is still possible to post and um, interact completely confidentially online. So a lot of young adults find themselves uh, really deep into stuff that is hurtful to them in spaces like Tumblr. Tumblr is a photo and video blogging service. Uh, some of the top searches in the last year, especially for an adolescent and young adult population in the West, are things like self-harm, yeah, and then a lot of porn. A lot of porn gets accessed through Tumblr. So sites like this, oftentimes kids are spending a lot of time here and having really difficult and painful experiences, and their parents or the important people in their lives don't have a clue how to help them with that. And if there is this split where the, where the people who aren't engaged in these tech spaces as much are looking down upon the people who are, there's also fear of revealing the kinds of difficult situations one has online because there's fear of shaming and, and punishment rather than connection and help. Snapchat is one of the most interesting of, uh, of these kinds of platforms that, that really shows all of those traits that we are looking for in tech spaces right now. And, and the reason that I think Snapchat is interesting is because it also points out that app developers don't just develop apps for our own good. They actually develop them to make money and to create a kind of experience. Snapchat is a, is a platform where probably most of you know you take a picture or a video, it, you send it to someone who you're connected to, it stays up on their screen for seven to 10 seconds and then supposedly it disappears. The reason that Snapchat is really interesting it, for me to tell you guys about right now is that just a year ago it was considering going public or making a public offering. It was valued around $10 billion. Shortly after that valuing, uh, some, somehow a second party app that, that kind of had hacked its way into Snapchat stole a bunch of images of celebrities without any clothing on. And they leaked these to the press pretty widely, right? And, and everyone in the media and tech world said, Snapchat will certainly die because these images don't really disappear and fade into ephemeral space. They actually live somewhere and can come up later to haunt you. Um, in reality, however, Snapchat kept pursuing uh, you know, new avenues and has come up with a couple of new amazing things that they offer now. They offer payment and they offer a new service called Story. And they have just been in the last two weeks valued at somewhere between 15 and 19 billion dollars. So even when an app has kind of been exposed as having really potentially harmful effects, it can go on to create huge and profound kind of um, both social change and impact for the creators of these apps. And we need to know that because they, they aren't just created for our own good. They are, they are created for other reasons. If you're interested in Snapchat specifically or anything related to pop culture and tech, I would encourage you to follow Casey Neistat on Vimeo or um, YouTube. He is fantastic and just put out a film about Snapchat that is great. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, YouTube, YouTube is a place where we spend a huge amount of our time. YouTube used to be one of the most visited sites, and it still is in the top five. However, right now, globally, I just looked at the end of last week, globally, the top three accessed apps um, are Uber. So this is internationally. Uber, the second one is, um, uh, it's, it's, oh, Show Me, which is a, a social app mostly used in the East. And, and then the third one is Snapchat. Snapchat is by far the most used, especially within the young adult and adolescent population. YouTube, the interesting thing about YouTube, if we talk about how technological spaces are hyper-dynamic and hyper-connected, meaning we want them to constantly be changing so that people want more and more and more and keep coming back, right? Every second, so this long, one 1,000, 300 hours of video are uploaded onto YouTube. That is profound. Most of you have probably seen nothing but high quality on YouTube, right? That builds your brain and makes you smarter. Not so much. <laughs> um, it really, really is profoundly important that we become aware that there are these things vying for our attention at all times that do not make us necessarily more complex, more uh, smart, more uh, deep, and more interesting. And we need to be aware of that. However, spaces at the same time, like YouTube, are for the first time ever creating their own experiences of embodied times. So the Super Bowl is a huge experience in the United States for bringing the culture together, right? watches the Super Bowl and people are just as excited about the ads and the halftime show. And this year for the first time, YouTube actually did its own halftime show and took a huge amount of the network population's viewing uh, uh, audience toward it, which means that, again, we are, we are gravitating toward these experiences 
less about kind of this social norm and more about our own unique experiences. When uh, President Obama gave his last State of the Union address, he was not interviewed afterward by network news anchors. This year he was interviewed by the three top YouTube celebrities. One of them was a 19-year-old um, from actually from Orange County and she has made her name in YouTube she has over 8 million followers and she has made her name in YouTube by making haul videos which are basically videos where she is given access to stores and she goes in and creates all kinds of um, outfits and then she goes to her home in, in Orange County and puts on all these outfits and shows them and them and young especially young adult women and high school and, and college age women watch them toward the eight million level, and then she is the one interviewing President Obama. The reason that that's important is, again, we go back to his credibility. So again, who are we looking to to get our information from? She did some great interviewing. The thing that's interesting about that, though, is that, again, the whole sense of people go to get help and connection is changing, and we need to be aware of it. This is another way that that's changing. We are more and more living in a culture that tells us that our technology can tell us more about people than our own gut can. This is the, at the CES, one of the most popular things this year were um, monitoring devices for babies. So these are monitors that babies wear that create highly anxious parents, by the way. If you look at the information on parenting right now, parents and especially at home uh, parents are at high risk for high levels anxiety right now because they have access to so much more information but they don't have access to using it. So they're keeping track of so much more but it doesn't necessarily have any more advanced tools. The other thing uh, that came out was uh, monitoring your pets. So there were pet monitors and baby monitors at the CES that allow you to kind of talk to your child or your pet through these devices that they wear on their tummies and to kind of record every, everything that they do. In terms of gamification, the thing we need to know is that we are moving toward a world where there will just be more connection via gaming. A lot of young adults who do uh, an internet connected gaming, their primary source of connection and community is in those spaces. And we're also seeing now gaming as an entertainment form. In the U.S., we also had the two, two first instances this year of uh, college students being given e or scholarships for participation in esports. So literally, they are given academic scholarships for So the Oculus will basically be this gaming device that you wear. And when you hear something back here, you turn and you see it. The thing that has <laughs> halted its release has been, <laughs> do you need to check something? All right. The thing that has halted its release is that it has made people incredibly nauseous. It is so realistic and so hyper kind of experiential that people have gotten sick while they've been using it. They just solved that two weeks ago, actually, so it will be released this year. But the reason that this is interesting to me as a psychologist is that this is going to make the gaming experience, which is a huge and profound amount of time that, that gamers spend playing games, it will make it even more immersive and isolative. So we are becoming increasingly isolated even when we are with others. And when you watch uh, photos or videos of individuals playing these games together with their oculuses on it's hilarious because they're all sitting in a group but they're all looking in a different direction and they're all having their own unique experience rather than having one together this is trending down also into younger and younger ages yeah yes you bet um, so in terms of thinking about gamification just we're moving toward more um, a, a setting in academics and in healthcare in most places where uh, we are trying to make the process of pursuing health and symptom reduction more like games. We are also using um, a, a method that I'll, I'll talk about later, but, but, but the problem with this is that most gaming uh, kinds of platforms use a very fixed mindset model, which is a model that is being shown by the research, especially research out of Stanford, to not be a particularly flexible model or accurate model in terms of what really defines um, intellect and and intellectual capability. Um, we're also seeing gaming be in huge arenas and platforms and be more a form of entertainment and passive entertainment. Um, this is how this is trending down to younger kids. This is, a, a, you know, this is an infant who is laying on a mat watching an iPhone in their toy. There are now uh, teething toys that you put iPhones in. There's an iPod where you put an iPad on this little 
device where you teach your child to you know, use the potty. Um, we are more and more trending down, which means we're inoculating kids to higher and higher levels of stimulation, meaning just sitting and playing with a, a single embodied face and person is no longer as stimulating. And that's because partially the, what we're going to find out is that these forms of screen-based stimulation kind of stimulate both neurological function and endocrine, the endocrine system in such a way that it creates literally a physiological desire for wanting more. Um, now, on average in the U.S., and the part of the reason that I'm going to be using U.S. statistics is because we've done a little bit uh, different forms of longitudinal research than what is available out there for a global market. But in the U.S., uh, it is now considered pretty accurate that we are spending on average 12 and a half hours a day with screens. How we get to this number is that if, if you control for multi-use, which now it is considered that anyone over the age, I mean, I'm sorry, under the age of about 40, multi-uses technology uh, on on mass, kind of. So we are using our cell phones while we're looking at a computer screen. We're watching a movie and we're texting. You know, so if you if you control for that multi-use and spread it out, it's 12 and a half hours. If you take the average 19-year-old right now and multiply that out, if that average 19-year-old continues to use technology at that rate, by the time they are 60, they will have dedicated 20 years of their lives to technology. So this is my 20-year-old son hugging my 60-year-old uncle. 20 years of their lives will be dedicated to this kind of this endeavor. And oftentimes what I find is if, if they know that, they will then become intentional about the choices that they make with their use. We know that that 12 and a half hours has to come from somewhere. It's not as though we've been given an additional 12 and a half hours a day. And this is where the research tells us that that time comes from. It comes from family talk time. It comes from social practice. Those two are especially important to me as a psychologist because family talk time is where we kind of develop the basic core sense of self that sustains us through life. It's sitting around with your, you know, with whoever happens to be in your home with you and having those weird, awkward conversations, having to bump up against the things you disagree with, with your parents or with your siblings. Um, it's, it's learning how to have conflict and how to have intimacy that happens in that family talk time that's crucial to the kind of the, the way in which the foundation of the self is laid. It's also crucial for developing the scaffolding upon which relationships will later be developed. And that, that's then also what concerns me about it coming from social practice. Social practice is just the opportunity to go into social settings and make an absolute idiot of yourself, to trip while you're walking into a room, and then to recover from it and find out that all of life does not end, to find out that you can live through awkward silences and conversations, and again, life does not end. But social practice is crucial, and we are taking that away at younger and younger ages. If you've got children, again, turned toward these small devices where they've got constantly stimulated images coming from, it means they are turning away from embodied connection that neurologically we know and psychologically we know is the foundation of what develops a core sense of self and healthy relational well-being. Sleep, sleep is a huge issue globally. Um, we are seeing, we are experiencing less and less of it and we are coming to know that that is having a profound effect in some ways and we're going to talk about that and it's also coming from physical activity which means we are having lower and lower physical acuity in the United States specifically we are now seeing preschool students who on average if you hand a seven-month-old child a small rectangular object of any kind the first thing they will do is swipe their hand across it yet we're seeing record and record numbers of preschoolers at later and later ages being able to do things like button the buttons uh, tie shoes um, it, so again, we are, we are more experienced in our bodies with doing things with screens than we are with doing things without them. The reason that I think this is so important is that if we look at people like trees, <laughs> um, we all come from some place. We come from a deep place of, of rootedness and groundedness. And parents, physicians, therapists, educators, we want to make sure that that soil, that the, that the tree of a child is growing out of is really healthy. So we are, you know, addending it and making sure it's rich and nutrient dense. And we are making sure that it gets the right amount of water and, and that it's going to grow these deep roots that will support its growing up. The tricky thing is that trees are also impacted by the, the contextual elements that they grow up into. This is a tree near my, near where I live on the coast. And, um, you know, it isn't, the coastal wind doesn't just automatically come to a healthy tree and then all of a sudden blow it over. But slowly over time, the wind and the elements shape 
the development of that tree. And I believe that the technological winds that we are living in, the media winds that we are living in, are having a profound effect on the shaping of several things, and research is bearing that out. These are the areas that we are being deeply shaped and profoundly shaped as people by our over-involvement with the technological um, advances. Our bodies are seeing a profound effect. Just the way in which our bodies are developing is changing. The way in which we experience our own sense of self and the way in which we function out of that sense of self is deeply and profoundly changing, and I call that the intrapersonal impact. Our relationships and the scaffolding upon which we build them is profoundly different than it was even 10 years ago. And then um, <coughs> the most new advance kind of that we're seeing come out in the research, I have talked about this across the other domains before, but now I'm talking about it as its own domain, is our sense of embodiment. Just the sense in which we invade or do not invade our own skin. How much of our bodies we, in, we are engaged with at all times, and I think we're seeing less and less of that. So we're going to start there. Um, really, we, are, we have access as physiological beings to all kinds of senses, and our bodies have natural message indicators. However, what I have found is that the more engaged people are with their devices, the, m the less engaged they are with their own kind of message indicators within their body. Um, so any way in which we can get people to engage any one of their senses, other than the visual, the sense of visual or auditory that we're receiving from screens, is a way of helping our embodied selves come more present. And that's really, really important not only to just be a healthy self, but that's important to be able to engage physical spaces with other people. I, as a psychologist, really believe, and some of the literature suggests, that some of the increase in self-harm that we see now in mental health circles has to do with the, w the way in which young adults and adolescents are so, have so much of their experience happening outside of their bodies in digital spaces. They don't actually know how to handle or manage emotions within their bodies, and so oftentimes th this is coming out in self-harm. I think porn has a huge eff effect on this as well, which we're going to talk about next. So, um, so, so be thinking as we talk about these other domains and the other ways in which these, these kind of contextual elements are shaping the person, think about the way in which we are or are not in our own bodies uh, as kind of an overarching theme. If we look at physiology, there are several things we're going to look at. And the first thing we're going to consider is the eye. Um, the eye is the first thing that, is, that we're seeing kind of some profound effects uh, from our over-engagement with screens. Basically, screens emit a light called blue light. It's part of the UV spectrum. And historically, the only way that our eye has experienced blue light is from the sun. Uh, that's very far away from us, right? <laughs> and many of us, when we are out in the sun, wear protection of, for our eyes, right? When the sun was the only form of UV light that was kind of aging the eye, we, it took a long time for us to see a physiological impact of that. Now, uh, f eye physicians, ophthalmologists, optometrists are seeing a profound trending down in things like cataracts and things like macular degeneration because that UV light is entering at a much closer distance, right? So we hold our screens closer and closer to us. And the smaller our screens become, or the smaller our devices become, the closer we hold them to us. This is a particular issue for children whose arms are proportionately shorter than adults. So they are holding the screens even closer to their eyes, meaning their eyes, the retina, is having access to greater damage at earlier ages. And, um, and, and that, that retina has a profound effect from this aging that is happening prematurely. There are several things you can do. I'm going to try to give you some intervention ideas throughout the talk today. Um, and this is, this is a huge one. Um, you know, and if you look at app development right now, many apps are becoming developed to create uh, filters for your devices so that your screen will dim and change colors at different times of day and things, which is fantastic. However, it's a little bit like adding a filter to a cigarette. Like, you know, like, we're going to put a filter on there, so smoke more of them. Um, so if you put a filter on your devices, you, kind of, you can feel lulled into safety. Uh, you, and we want to be aware that our eye actually needs us to become moderate with our use, which is my message overall. Technology is here and it's here to stay, but if we become intentional and moderate, we could profoundly affect some of the, or affect the way in which it's, it's shaping us. Turn away from screens an hour before bed. The other reason that this is important is that basically uh, when you are interacting with a blue light screen, 
you are also encouraging your body to release endorphins. And, um, and it's, it's almost like holding a mood box light right up to your face right before you go to bed. <laughs> so you're, you're telling yourself, I, I need to sleep, I'm in bed, but you're telling your brain like, wake up, be alert, don't be sad, don't be low. And we need to be aware of that. So turning away from screens an hour before bed is important for sleep and physiology. Um, using ambient instead of overhead light just to helps affect for the way in which your eye kind of takes in the screen-based um, impact. Place screens next to instead of in front of windows, apply filters, but don't use that as a false sense of security. And then mostly just limit your time with screens. Another physiological effect is that we are seeing profound levels of thumb arthritis now in, uh, trending down. And actually some literature is suggesting that football players, especially high school football players and rugby players, are being asked to not text because it is affecting the way in which our grip is able to uh, be managed and controlled. It is profound, again, becoming aware that this affects us. Uh, carpal tunnel, hand arthritis, or thumb arthritis is huge. Then if we look physiologically at some of the most profound effects and where the research is showing us the most profound effects, it's with the brain, the neurological system, and the endocrine system. And let me tell you about that. Basically, um, probably most of you, especially if you are working in mental health, have done some basic research on uh, neuroplasticity and neurological development, but where the brain fires together, it wires together, meaning whatever experiences you expose your brain to create deep grooves. So, so information comes in through one form of your senses. It gets, tr it gets transmitted through the brain through a series of electrical impulses and gets sent to a, a location, probably usually in the back of the brain, where it's decoded and encoded. Um, screen forms of stimulation, even if you are viewing a variety of things, tend to come in and come through the brain as one form of stimulation, creating this deep groove in the brain, meaning we are giving our brain one experience over and over and over rather than a variety of experiences, and this deeply and profoundly affects the complexity of our brain. We also know that um, with things like video gaming, uh, that there are, are endocrine system responses. So when an individual is inter interfacing with a video game, frequently their endocrine system is releasing adrenaline and cortisol at these surging levels that is creating this heightened sense of alertness and awareness that also can very quickly turn to actually a sense of agitation, a sense of inability to be still and quiet. So we have the neurological system and the endocrine system being kind of activated and elevated in these ways that both stimulate and kind of um, force a lack of complexity in some really interesting ways. And I'm going to show you how that happens. Um, basically, what the brain learns over time through your experience is, is how long it's going to need to wait for the next piece of information. And we actually know that the brain being able to wait, the brain being able to be, the brain and the body being able to tolerate boredom is highly correlated with levels of creativity, it's correlated with levels of academic success, it's, it's uh, correlated with levels of life satisfaction. So if the brain knows that it needs to wait and is able to do that, is able to help the body regulate when it's sending out all these kind of endocrine kind of symptom signals, um, if, if it's able to do that, we will have a much more satisfied life, we'll be more creative, we'll be happier. The tricky thing is, is that life does not provide us with opportunities like it used to, to be bored, to tolerate waiting. And I'm going to show you that, how, how that has advanced through these next uh, slides. This is Sesame Street. This is the opening credits from 1963, I believe. And I want you to just pay attention to each sustained visual shot. So count the number of seconds in each sustained shot from 1963, thinking that this is the brain, you know, waiting for the next image. between 
five to ten seconds if we watch the whole thing you'd get five to ten seconds so the brain is basically learning okay I gotta keep waiting and it's gonna come oh there it is okay now I gotta keep waiting it's gonna come there it is but we learn in watching this that, that you really do have to sustain now let's look at Sesame Street from 1983 and see what's happening same thing take a take a look at um, the intro from 83 what's happening so we're trending down now the, so the brain's going like I gotta wait three or four seconds I gotta wait three or four seconds okay now it's again okay now let's take a look at a couple years ago So if you'll see what's happening now, there is no sustained shot. Do you see this? And this is educational programming, which I love Sesame Street. <laughs> I mean, but this is where we have come, where we now have a constantly changing visual image available to us at all times. Um, and if any image is too static, we have access to, uh, to powerful computing devices in our pockets that can make it so that we don't have to sustain focus. So you can imagine what it's like for kindergarten teachers when kids have been actually flooded with this kind of stimulation that tells them they never have to wait for the next thing. And now suddenly they're sitting in a classroom with one teacher that is profoundly difficult. Does this make sense? We're seeing across the country, it's interesting to me when I talk with educators, I am hearing from them uh, at mass numbers of kind of higher incidence of masturbatory behavior under the desk in classrooms to, in as young as second grade students. And I think that's largely because we don't, the brain literally doesn't know how to wait for the next thing, how to wait to be stimulated. The way that we see this in adult programming, because this is not just children's programming anymore, is, is in things like this. So, so even we now have a hard time waiting. We don't wait because we don't have to. And here's how this has evolved. 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are in NBC's riveting. World Communications okay, so. Center in the heart of Radio City, New York. We are in touch with the world. We'll tell you what's happening now, if you'll today. Notice this is one My name is Jack LaStewart. And here is Dave Garrow. Well, here see we are. Awesome and good morning for you. The very first good morning of what I hope and suspect will be a great many good mornings between you and I. Here it is, Jack said, January 14th. <laughs> it's just worth the whole clip right there. Okay. Then we move on to, and so you see the whole, this entire, we could watch this whole episode is just this. And then the camera pans. But again, we were used to waiting. Now let's see how that plays out in, again, several years down the road. Again, watch the, this number of seconds. So we're down to about five seconds on each clip, right? And I love, I'm, I'm a big Today Show fan. But now let's take a look at now. And take a look at how even when there is a sustained visual image in the photography, watch what is happening with the logo. It is as though we, they, they know we can't hold our attention. So you'll see the logo is even, it's hard to see in here, but the logo is even kind of, it pulses and changes. Um, and this is why we have to own that even we are buying into this, right? And we are um, in a place where we really, we cannot, our brains literally are wired now to expect the next new thing at all times. Um, we're going to catch up here a minute. Um, and as a result of that, there we go, as a result of that, our brains literally have underdeveloped 
in the regions that have to do with self-control, emotional regulation, attuned communication. This all happens in an area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex requires, it requires opportunities to have to focus, to have to be still, to have to um, kind of, to be able to be very directly um, attentive in order to have wiring occur in this prefrontal cortex. Neurologists tell us in parts of the brain where we do not stimulate, so if we are not stimulating a portion of the brain, it gets pruned off. It just, the wiring doesn't happen there with the same kind of fiercity or fierceness and um, intensity. And that is what's happening with these important regions of our brain. Um, it's, uh, this I just find interesting for students of all kinds. Many of you maybe saw this research. It was everywhere, all around the world. Uh, the researchers did, were trying to see, could, did we retain information better if we took notes by hand or if we typed notes? And basically they found that in every way that they, that they tweaked the research, Every single time we retain information better when we write notes by hand. And there's all kinds of literature out there that shows that when we take the time to engage one more form of our senses, our retention and the way in which it activates the brain is almost 100% of the time more, um, more robust and, and that's important to be aware of. So how do we kind of limit or, or, or control for some of these neurological impacts and endocrine system impacts uh, that, that all of this tech immersion is having. These are some things. Sometimes force yourself to delay gratification. So rather than watching the entire season of Downton Abbey in one sitting, like watch one episode a week. It's like a radical act of civil disobedience anymore <laughs> to force yourself to wait. But literally sometimes force yourself to wait. Teach self-soothing skills. If we don't know how to be soothed anymore, if we don't know how to be still and quiet, which our brains do not get the necessary kind of opportunities to, to develop that skill anymore, we will constantly be turning to things because we don't know how to be unstimulated. So, so you know, in, in the past, when we didn't have access to 24-7 uh, forms of entertainment and stimulation, we just were forced to wait. So, so for instance, there were a long periods of time where there was no television on from midnight to seven in the morning, you know? Um, and you just had to wait. Stores weren't open 24 hours a day. You had to wait. Um, and so sometimes making sure that we are able to tell ourselves, hey, it's gonna be okay. I can wait for it, is really important for the complex wiring of your brain. It is crucial. And life will not hand you those opportunities. You have to make them. Um, limit, limit your screen time early on and choosing slower moving media. Meaning we have all habituated to a high level of engagement with technology. And so if we can break those habits and set a new norm of moderateness and asking some more of our systems and ourselves, there's a profound impact that can, that can be had. And then finally, celebrating boredom. Literally sometimes doing absolutely nothing. Nothing. Like really nothing, <laughs> not just, you know, like, oh, I'm going to passively watch something. You know, that's what uh, people tend to do. You know, at the end of the day, what, is, what do people want to do? They want to go watch something on Netflix. They want to play a video game. They want to check their social media. All of those things activate the brain in those deep grooves that you've already been activating the brain in all day. We want to actually activate different parts of our brain. It's really important when we talk about uh, the physiology that I hit on a couple of things that are actually unique and special and I, and I hold them to the, to the side because they, they are showing in the literature to have a more profound effect than other forms of screen-based stimulation. Um, actually, new research came out and since I had had to uh, turn these slides in earlier, I wasn't able to add it, but it actually research came out two days ago that, that showed some interesting dynamic that I would add to this. We're going to talk about violent, vi violent images and sexual images, but I actually want to add a piece of, li of literature before that. So uh, research out of the University of Waterloo in Canada just was uh, published two days ago, and it basically showed that of heavy cell phone users, especially smartphone users, and this research was very well constructed, but individuals who tend to be highly reliant upon their cell phones and who tend to be intuitive thinkers, so thinkers who make decisions from their gut or from their feelings more than from analysis and, and you know, clear, logical, sequential consideration, um, tend to use their search function on their smartphones more often 
than individuals who are more analytic in their decision making. And that that is actually creating less of a sense of complexity neurologically for these folks. So we need to be aware. So the more, it basically what that's saying is that we used to, so I was thinking of that even on the way here. When an individual had to use a Thomas guide or a map to navigate freeways and roads, there was a lot of critical thinking that had to happen. And then there was storage because you couldn't be flipping the pages on the Thomas guide while you were driving, right? So you were having to memorize things, you were having to make a plan. Now, when you just punch something into your GPS and trust it to tell you, that's that reliance, it creates less complexity and you are thinking less deeply. You'll hear this, I would imagine many of the faculty here at Cal Southern have experienced this, where individuals now have um, kind of profoundly huge bibliographies, but maybe have not thought very deeply critically because we don't wrestle with information in the same way and with the same depth that we used to. We need to be aware of that. Okay, then if we, if we turn to kind of uh, violence and sexuality, these things tend to have a higher impact on both the neurological system and the endocrine system. When individuals are spending a lot of time looking at images like this, violent gaming, there is no research that correlates or that says that, that high um, exposure to violent images, either in passive or active ways, so meaning passive would be when you're watching a, a show or a movie that has a lot of violent images, active would be when you're actually manipulating what is happening with the violence. Individuals who see a lot of this, their behavior is not correlated with criminal forms of violence in the research, Doesn't, that does not pan out. What does pan out is that individuals who are seeing and experiencing these high forms of uh, violent stimulation, which is releasing all kinds of adrenaline, all kinds of uh, cortisol, so like this, the, and cor yeah, cortisol, which is kind of bathing the system in the stress hormone. Um, also, the brain is releasing high levels of dopamine. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that is also activated by drug, for, for drug addicted individuals. So there's this, with dopamine, there's this kind of surge of dopamine that happens when you take in a violent image. And over time, that the level of violence doesn't bring the same level of dopamine release. So we want more violence to release more dopamine. And it creates kind of a sense of um, needing and wanting more. Basically, these, these kinds of neurological and endocrine responses are being highly correlated in the literature with soft forms of relational violence. So bullying, um, sarcasm, psychological lie, uh, which is just kind of like a, a, mis a misconstruing in our communication with other people in embodied spaces. So high correlation between viewing violence and these soft forms of relational violence that do not, if you are the recipient of cyberbullying <laughs> or any form of bullying, do not feel soft in any way. Um, and, and they are more a sense of, a lot of um, the adolescent literature is showing this kind of new kind of, uh, it's actually almost it looks like a physiological and emotional response that comes out of the gaming experience when it's very violent that leads with this sense of sarcasm, this sense of kind of toughness and hardness and, and, and um, bullyish type behavior. Similarly with highly, um, highly sexualized images, especially within the way in which now uh, highly sexualized images are taken in, which is typically in about at, at least in the United States, if you look at Pornhub stats, um, people are taking in porn for about between 9 to 11 minutes in a session. And in that 9 to 11 minutes, they are typically doing a rapid cycling of different images. So they are accessing either 9 to 12 different sites within that 9 to 11 minutes. That means that the body is constantly reacting and looking for, again, dopamine is being released and it wants greater surges every time. And this is creating a profound psychological effect, which we're gonna talk about later, but it's also creating levels of sexual dysfunction that we need to talk about. So at earlier and earlier ages now, we're seeing things like, um, well, just things that we would not have seen uh, historically with a younger population. So erectile dysfunction, absolutely issues with arousal and um, even sexual desire that we have so kind of flooded the system and made the system so hypersexually aware that folks are having a very difficult time then navigating the sexual experience in embodied spaces. Um, there is a huge um, issue with erectile dysfunction with college age uh, young men now partially because they are just the embodied experience is so not in any way uh, similar to or comparable to their experience with screens. And this is not just an issue for, for men. This is absolutely an issue for women as well. 
Um, this just shows some of the Pornhub stats uh, and the, the access to number of pages per day. Uh, but again, the thing to know is that there's this cycling. The other physiological effect on this, of this is that we are seeing body dysmorphia in, in levels that we've never seen before. So pediatricians now in the U.S. are being asked to screen for eating disorders in young girls as young as five and young boys as young as seven now. Because, because of the flooding of images of idealized bodies that are, that are absolutely shaped by digital tools, um, we are seeing kind of a desire for people to try to shape their physiological bodies in these ways and it's having a profound effect. This, this goes um, you know, across time, but we need to talk with kids about how their bodies are not like the bodies that they see. This was an example, this was an ad that got uh, leaked, the, I mean the, ac the actual ad went out before the editor had come in and filled in where they had taken out her inner thighs, if you see here. But I love when things like this happen because then we can use them as tools to show young children Actually, everyone has inner thighs. <laughs> the people that you see have had these images changed. The other way that I see a physiological impact of all of this is that we see, at least in the West, um, and there's some indication I've been reading about this, some indication of this in Africa as well in the literature, but that the abuse of prescription and non-prescription drugs is on the increase profoundly. And I think that's partially because our brains and our endocrine system don't know how to be soothed in the same way that they have been in the past. We don't have the natural opportunities to develop those skills. Therefore, we are reliant upon things from the outside of us creating kind of a sense of calm or creating a sense of alertness. So on college campuses in the West, um, you see the use of ADHD medications profoundly increased during finals week. They are easy to access and people feel actually at a disadvantage oftentimes if they don't use them as a help to their focusing. And we also see um, the use of things like marijuana and other prescription medications to bring the self down because again, we don't know how to soothe. So those are the, the, the profound physiological effects. We want to watch the way in which we model, both with body awareness and drug and alcohol use. Um, I, I notice a lot of times parents will be very concerned about their children's use of drugs to soothe or comfort or stimulate them. But they, if you look at their own social profiles, all of their images are rife with themselves holding a wine glass or, hold, you know, and, and even those subtle messages are really important when we begin thinking about how to shape our children's experience. Okay, then we're going to talk, we're going to move into now kind of how all of this technology is shaping our sense of self. This one is, is um, I, what I am most interested in and where there is the least amount of research to this point because it's a really hard thing to measure. Uh, but I, I would love if, if everyone who participates in this, in this, listening to this or experiencing this talk today could begin to think about just how technology is shaping literally the way in which we interact with ourselves. We really are living in an increasing time where the self is seen as a commodity. So wherever we are, we're thinking about how do we brand ourselves? How do we promote ourselves? What, what do we have to give out into the world in these ways? We see this even in the artistic community as I travel. I see more and more museums putting up things like, you know, no selfie sticks. Um, because selfies are just the, the name of the game now. We're, we're always about promoting where we've been. And I think actually we are living in a time where self-promotion pretty much 100% of the time uh, trumps self-love or self-awareness. And this is deeply, deeply important. Um, if you look at the research across the globe, actually this is international research, there is you know, just growing evidence that the more an individual clicks in Facebook, the, the more likely they are to experience low self-esteem, high levels of anxiety, high levels of depression. Um, this is, you know, being fed all the time by the development of more and more tools with which we can perfect ourselves. If you look at the apps being downloaded by adolescents right now and young adults, they are largely these self-improvement apps that you can, you actually you download them and then they apply themselves as filters to any image of yourself that you put in a social network. So I could download, one of them's called I think Skinny, skinny Pics. I could download that and then anytime I put a picture online it would make me skinnier. Um, and literally these are, there's a preponderance of these kinds of um, opportunities out there for people to kind of 
present this falsified self. And psychologically, if you think about that, if I present a falsified self and then I get you to, to kind of notice me based on this falsified self, then I become a little bit concerned about when you actually meet me in an embodied space and find out that I am not this person that you have been led to believe that I am. And it creates this psychological discomfort and kind of feeling of where am I safe to then actually exist as the authentic person that I am. The way that I think about this is kind of as, as a locus of control. I add a little T to make it more memorable. Um, but, but you know, we, uh, there is a locus, a loci, that's the center. There's a center of the control that we have over how we're going to feel about ourselves. And we can either have that center of control be outside of us and say like, I am gauging how to feel about myself based on how all of you look and you all look bored, so I am terrible. And, or we can say like, no, the center of how I'm going to feel about myself is going to be inside of me, which is psychologically what we would, what, that's, a, that's kind of a hearty, wholehearted person, has this deep internal sense that can say, everyone in this room is falling asleep, but I still know that I have something important to share, so I'm going to keep going, and people are going to wake up, and it's going to be okay, or you know, whatever it is. But, but literally, it is very hard now for individuals growing up to actually have that locus of control inside of them. So much of their world exists outside of them. And in fact, when I do things like ask, I, uh, I have a group of folks th who are kind of in that young adult population, that I ask, what are the things that are most tricky for you right now? What's hardest for you? And the thing that I consistently hear is, the hardest thing for them is keeping up on all the different social platforms that they know either could be reporting on them or that they are reporting to. Um, they know that you know, every employer is going to Google them before they are interviewed. They know that, that they need to be on top of their digital presence. And it's very, very um, difficult to maintain a deep internal locus of control saying, I can feel about myself certain ways while you're constantly being faced with how the world feels about you. I, ho I hope that makes sense. There, there are also apps coming out and development in digital spaces constantly that challenge this internal sense of self. This is the newest one, Yik Yak, which um, is wreaking havoc wherever it goes. Before it was Juicy Campus. Juicy Campus was a site where colleges would create a presence on Juicy Campus, or not, <laughs> the colleges didn't create their presence, but a student would create a presence, um, and then people would post to Juicy Campus completely anonymously things like fattest girls at UCLA, um, best blow jobs at Stanford, literally, and then anybody could just post to this anonymously. Juicy Campus was shut down, actually. It was one of the first websites that actually was shut down. It was kind of profoundly beautiful that somebody actually was willing to go to bat for that legally. Uh, but Yik Yak still exists. And Yik Yak, the tricky thing with Yik Yak is that it reflects as a, as a domain and as a space online, it reflects a lot of those things that I talked about being important in digital spaces right now in that it is hyper-local and it is hyper-dynamic, meaning that it posts, it only posts things to, like if we all were on Yik Yak right now, the things that it would give to us or feed to us are things that are happening within a one mile radius of us. Meaning students in high schools and colleges can use this to deeply, deeply, deeply bully very well and with 100% anonymity. So for instance, a university that I was recently speaking at in Texas was having a cultural awareness week and there were some students on campus posting on Yik Yak through the entire conference incredibly racially hurtful and horrific things on Yik Yak and then gaining an audience. So they were kind of creating this very hostile environment for an event that was intended to be this beautiful thing. And this is what's happening kind of all the time. So we need to be able to be aware of this so that we can teach young adults and we ourselves can continue to create opportunities to develop resilience, to develop emotional regulation, to develop empathy. The tricky thing is if you look at the psychological construct of empathy, empathy really only can grow in an individual that has a deeply profoundly internal locus of control who is resilient and has some sense of emotional regulation. And if these traits aren't in place, empathy cannot exist because there's then this constant need, I'm not being empathic with your experience, I'm needing you to take care of how I should feel about myself. So I'm willing to pander or do whatever is needed to make that occur. Another tricky thing about developing this sense of self is that we now live in a time where we basically believe that soothing ourselves 
is by stimulating ourselves. <laughs> so we soothe ourselves with things like trivia crack. Uh, before that, it was Candy Crush. Um, before that, it was Angry Birds. <laughs> and these are all games that are literally, you, you ask at, at the American Medical Association uh, Conference, I mean, sorry, American Psychiatric Association Conference several years back, they actually, as a spoof, held a 12-step um, group for Angry Bird addicts. And it was a joke, but so many people showed up <laughs> that, that they actually kind of made it a thing. Um, and, and then you'll, you'll hear it, or you'll see in the literature when they report on it how, how many even physicians and psychologists would say, like, or psychiatrists would say, like, I deleted it, but then I had to reload it. I mean, literally, these things capture our attention and they take our time and then we stop even being desirous of soothing ourselves. Candy Crush is a perfect example of this. Candy Crush is a free download. It's a game you can play. It's, it was, it's created to be very addictive and it is very addictive. Um, and, it, and, and people think, you know, oh, it's free. It's no problem, no big deal. Well, in Candy Crush, you basically have a certain number of tries to pass a level. And if you don't pass that level in the certain number of tries that you are given, you have to wait 30 minutes to try again. Well, so many people who play Candy Crush cannot wait the 30 minutes and instead choose to push the one button. For 99 cents, you can buy another attempt at it immediately. And as of last week, it was bringing $918,000 a day. $918,000 a day based on our inability to wait 30 minutes, right? We have to create some opportunities to soothe ourselves. Soothing ourselves, being able to be bored is highly, like I said before, correlated with creativity. Research shows it again and again. The other thing that, that benefits our creativity, benefits our intelligence, are these three constructs. And when I look at the literature and, and think about the way in which technology is impacting the sense of self, these are the three constructs that strike me as being in the decline so profoundly that we don't even have a structure upon which to develop a sense of self anymore. This is just, it's easy for at least Americans to remember FDR maybe, and this is the ability to focus. Can you focus? And, and now in the literature, here's how pitiful, I, I, I think it's pitiful. Um, now we are trying to see if people can focus on one thing for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. That's not very long, <laughs> right? You know, the, the, pat the literature in the past was looking, can people focus on one form of stimulation for 30 minutes? Now we're down to, if you can focus for 10 minutes, that's good. And if you think about it, screen-based stimulation and screen-based um, experience basically rewards a scanning of the environment. So you're looking all around the environment. That's what advertising is trying to do all the time on a screen. It's trying to capture your attention and pull you off track. So again, we're needing to create opportunities for focus on one thing, an ability to delay we've already talked about it, and then an ability to regulate, which basically means I can have an impulse or an emotion or a thought and not need to act on it impulsively immediately, which anymore now, these little things allow us the opportunity to act on about 10 things at once immediately, right? Sometimes we need to not do that. Sometimes we need to do one thing at a time and actually complete it. I have checked again last night, and I can't find any piece of research that shows that multitasking actually increases productivity or efficiency. It is a fancy word we have made up for distractibility, and it actually lowers efficiency and effectiveness in, in the research, all the research I can find. This is fantastic research. I would encourage everyone to check it out. It's from University of Virginia. They basically put uh, research participants, it's a very well-constructed study, in a small room with no stimulation for 10 minutes. And they could either choose to sit and be in that room for 10 minutes with no stimulation or administer low-level shocks to themselves during that 10 minutes so that they didn't have to be bored. And a majority of people administered the shocks to themselves. And so it is just profound that we're aware of that. Another thing we have to be aware of in terms of when we think about self, it isn't just that it's hard now to develop a self. We have a growing world of technological advancement and media that is vying for our data and vying for our information so as to be able to deliver us a more um, comfortable and personalized experience, right? So you guys are probably fed all kinds of, when you open up your, your browser, it feeds you articles you might be interested in. Or I don't know if you've noticed this, you click on some product and then suddenly for the next month, that product appears on every page you look at and you think like, man, I've got the best taste in the world. And then you realize, 
No, they are just doing that to make me think I've got the best taste in the world, right? So there is this constant sense of data collection that I find, what I find it's creating in both in individuals I am speaking with and in actually people that I see in my office sometimes, is this sense that my experience of the world is everybody's experience of the world. So I don't have to bump up against anybody's opinion that's different from mine anymore. I can find somebody that agrees with me on everything. <laughs> and the more I click on that, the more I get of that. And it creates this kind of sense that, well, isn't everybody else reading the same exact thing I'm reading? And isn't everybody else experiencing the same thing I'm experiencing? The other tricky thing about this is that it begins to create an algorithm. And the younger that we have children interacting with these technologies, they are creating a digital algorithm for themselves that will be continually and perpetually fed. So an individual who's struggling with an eating disorder, who's looking for Dis, you know, who's looking for tips online is creating an algorithm that is going to feed that individual things about eating disorders for a long time down the future. Does this make sense? So it creates this pathway that doesn't allow for the kind of experience of dynamic, uh, kind of a dynamic diversity that grows a healthy sense of self. Um, I'm going to show you the newest product to do this, that, and, and I think this just shows this is where products are going. Uh, go ahead, no, go ahead. Okay, um, and, and this is really hard to hear, so, so you're going to have to kind of focus because this is just video that was taken during a trade show um, and then uploaded. But think about the profound effect of, of, of kind of your choices beginning to shape the kinds of questions that are asked of you. And then also listen to the way in which Barbie interacts. I had a therapist uh, at, a, at a talk I gave last week basically say, like, I'm trying to teach my couples how to talk to each other like this all the time. Like, and if you're getting your empathic responses from a screen rather than an embodied person, what, at a young, young age, what kind of an impact that would have? So, so take a look. For the very first time, Barbie can carry on a two-way dialogue. So we're using Wi-Fi and speech recognition technology. So she's going to be the very first fashion doll that can actually continue with learning. So she can carry on a unique relationship with So she's going to play interactive games. She can tell jokes. She inspires storytelling. She's going to be able to listen and learn to the girls' preferences and then adapt to those accordingly. Best of all, this is cool, she's got Wi-Fi capabilities, so she, all the content is stored up in a cloud, so we can actually push new data to her, so she's constantly staying relevant and up to date. Very cool. So this is just a prototype, it's a fraction of what she'll be able to do, and this is Hello World. Welcome to New York, Barbie. I love New York. Don't you? Tell me, what's your favorite part about the city? The food, the fashion, or the sight? Fashion or sites. Food. Food. We like the food in the restaurants. I love the food. Where else can you find so many types? What's your favorite food? Favorite food? In New York? Italian. We like Italian food. I've never eaten that before. You have to take me to try it. Oh, we will definitely. It is a date, okay? Well, we are on stage to show all these lovely people how amazing you are, Barbie. Being on stage is exciting, isn't it? Yes, I love it. That's cool. I didn't know that about you. I like to be on stage, too. So she can recognize and respond, so she understands, but she can also remember. So she's going to get to know all my likes, all my dislikes, and then she will incorporate that into our conversation. Barbie, what should I be when I grow up? warm in the freezing cold. Oh, good one. Did you know I already have a superpower? I can make myself invisible, but only when no one's looking. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> so it really brings out Barbie's personality. She'll really uh, keep in that relationship that girls have with her. And then over time through those interactive games and questions and answers, they'll really become best friends. Hi, Barbie. It was so nice talking to you. You too. Hope you get to enjoy some delicious food. Thank you. Goodbye. 
So again, we're talking about New York because we're here in New York, so, but she will have topics. you see though. where we're moving. Uh, the newest Hot Wheel toy this Christmas was one that you, uh, don't, you don't take the Hot Wheel car and run it on the ground. You actually put it on your iPad and the track under the car moves, so you just keep the car here and the track is moving under you and it feeds you information and asks it. More and more we're just attaching to these devices, right? And they kind of, this doll, who will only, never make you share. You don't ever have to share anything with this doll. I mean, like, you know, because it's a doll. So you don't have to, you, you just don't have to bump up against the, dis the discomfort that we normally would have with playmates and learn how to kind of share space, have conflict and things. And also, it's creating this kind of unrealistically empathic, constantly only focused on you reality in a very different way. So there are a couple kinds of interventions I want to talk about in terms of how we, um, we can control for or uh, manage some of these intrapersonal impacts. The first, the digital ones are to, to keep technology out in the open, especially to encourage families to have their screens and the, the ways in which kids are especially are attached to, to, tech, uh, to their technological devices out in the open. You know, when I was growing up, um, I, I uh, had a TV in my family room, you know, and if, if, if I was going to watch the Forbidden Show, and, th and this was the only TV in the house, it w which at my house, the Forbidden Show was the love boat, um, and my dad called it Smut Barge, that's how much he hated that show, and if I was going to watch it, very likely he was going to walk in, or someone was going to walk in, and then I was going to be found out, and then I was going to have to have this conversation about how this, this content wasn't helpful to my maturity and my blah, 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 which was highly, highly motivational to not do that. Now our technologies are such that we have an isolated experience them and we have them completely outside of the purview of any of the wise counsel around us. And so there's no kind of help in discerning what the content that we're taking is. Whereas if we have the screens out and about, then there is kind of some help from those around us. Installing filters is really important. One of the things I find that's happening on a lot of college campuses is a lot of individuals, especially individuals who are highly distracted or individuals who have had real issues with porn, are switching from smartphones to flip phones uh, because it just helps them not feel like there's such a constant <laughs> temptation to be distracted. Um, but, but again, if, if you're not going to switch all the way over, at least installing filters, there are all kinds of apps and filters that you can install that will turn your uh, router off at a certain time or uh, disable social networks for a period of time during your day so that you can engage. Maybe turning your notifications off so that you aren't constantly attending to that. Um, and then if, you're ta if we're talking about actually content filters that you're going to put on home kind of systems so that kids don't get access to things that hurt them early on, um, you have to talk with your kids also about what you're going to do or what they're going to do when the filter fails or when they get around it. It isn't anymore when or if kids are going to experience porn, it's when and, and it's happening at younger and younger ages and they're having access, they're, a lot of times their first experience with porn is a much higher level of intensity than any other time in history. So we need to tell kids, you know, you're going to stumble across things that are going to both titillate and excite and freak you out and it's okay to tell me. And we need to help parents know that they can, they can be told. And then the parents can go and freak out on their own later, but they need to be able to welcome their children and help their children process what, what they're going to be experiencing because the filters will fail. They will. And we need to, or they're going to be at someone's house without filters. Um, we have to talk about um, and teach, I believe, and if we all start this even in our own ways, teaching digital literacy and safety. So knowing how to, know, how to discern if content that you find in digital spaces is reliable and accurate and of qu uh, high quality is important. Um, we also want to encourage people to structure life so that technology does not become their child's best friend. A lot of kids who are very into gaming, even adults who are very into gaming, they spend such immersive and such large quantities of time with their gaming communities that those really are their closest friends, not people in embodied spaces. And we always want to make sure that there is some form of kind of balance. I also encourage uh, families to make earbuds a privilege. A lot of times um, parents will want their kids to have earbuds in all the time because they don't want to be bothered by what's going on and you know, <laughs> the sound. However, it's really important that all of us be willing to be inconvenienced and uncomfortable to allow the growth of other people. So if, if a lack of earbuds lets us know what's happening for those around us and what they're taking in in such a way that we can help them, it's important.
Then the non-digital interventions, I want to encourage all of us to go away from this experience with each other today kind of uh, modeling a beautiful sense of an internal locus of control, having a deep sense of I am okay in this world and I'm willing to take risks to encounter who you authentically are in this world and have that be awkward and live through it and be okay. Um, I, I love to encourage us all to be willing to make some, some silly failures. You know, we're great anymore at trying to kind of make our lives look perfect in spaces, but we need to also be in touch with reality that we're all authentic people. Uh, we need to be able to be bored. Boredom is important. Go have a boredom party, like literally, and invite others to it with you. Um, teach emotional regulation and soothing. Access those um, kind of abilities to focus, to delay, and to regulate, and then create opportunities to keep practicing those. And then I would encourage everybody to try at least some periods of the week where they turn off push notifications. They disable cookies. Like, actually experience the world as it is. A bunch of diverse, wacky differentness kind of bumping up against each other to create some really new kind of realities. If you are working with, if you are a mental health professional, or, or anyone, or a parent, and you're working with individuals who have any one of these kinds of temperaments, a temperament that tends toward addictive kinds of behaviors, a tendency to, to lean toward antisocial uh, kinds of behaviors, and I mean this in both forms of the word antisocial, kind of more that lacking empathy and lacking a moral compass or just not preferring social embodied spaces, uh, you want to be aware. If you have an individual who is anxiety prone, digital spaces create a heightened sense of anxiety for almost everyone, just because they are so constant and there's such a feeling that you kind of have to be constantly aware. Um, if you have an attention-seeking kiddo in your life or person in your life, very likely they are uh, maybe not even aware that they're struggling with creating an authentic sense of self because they're so focused on what they're creating outside of themselves, but you want to be aware of that. And then if you have a real uh, kind of risk taker, or a loner, um, those folks tend to find themselves more prone to over-engagement with screens and you want to help them. Okay, out of that sense of self is where we then develop a sense of relationship with others. If we don't have an authentic, honest relationship with ourselves about our own strengths and weaknesses, about our abilities, about our inabilities, it's going to be very hard for us to have healthy relationships with other people. And that's why I talk about the sense of self first. That's the place where we start. Um, a couple of, I think it's now months ago, uh, well, no, a month ago, a researcher, a style reporter for the New York Times uh, republished these 36 questions out of a, a past piece of literature that, that were created by a social scientist to kind of, you, uh, you basically the social science experiment was that you find a person, in particular if you have a partner, your partner, and you, you sit across from each other and you ask each other these 36 questions and you listen to the answer and then you follow that little interview session with four minutes of just looking into each other's eyes and lo and behold, guess what happened? People reported higher feelings of love. And, 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 <laughs> and this, this style reporter who published it thought maybe she'd get, you know, like, I don't know, a couple hundred clicks. She ended up with eight million clicks immediately and everyone in all the press was all abuzz because talking to people and looking in their eyes actually increased feelings of love. I'm thinking like, this is just a conversation. Like, this is what we already know, right? Like, we know this, and yet it is becoming a foreign kind of something we don't do anymore. And that's partially because we have these decreased attention spans. We are highly distractible. We've already talked about this. So our brain, our endocrine system, our sense of self is distractible. We've got lower uh, ability to attend to things. We also just have a lack of experience with discourse in a way that no other generation before this has. We just don't have embodied person to embodied person discourse in the same way. Even the way in which we communicate is differently. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but on platforms like Instagram, no longer do we give the real thing we're trying to say as the thing we first type. The thing we first type now is this quippy comment, you know, like, orange sky, and then hashtag beautiful sunset on my drive home. 
So we put what we're actually really trying to say in this hashtag after this kind of cool thing we say at the start. So we are actually changing the way in which discourse happens. And, and, and that's important for us to know. We also, if you look at the relational reality now, there is a huge fear of missing out that has never existed in the past because we had no clue what we were missing out on at the same level or rate that we do now. So there is this constant scanning that is occurring and we're, we're kind of aware of so many options that we can tend to feel overloaded and the quality of our relationships I think really really is looking different. We now look like we have wider nets of relationships so we have a wider range but for many many people and the research is starting to kind of look at this now there is a lack or a feeling that there is a lack of depth that there isn't the same kind of kind of um, knowing that you've got people with you for the long haul in the tough times. You've got a very full plate of people who you're connected to, but not so much the depth. This is also um, fed by an ever-growing and constantly changing uh, bunch of spaces that we can live in. These are Facebook is tending to be gravitated away from in young adults and adolescents now. Most of them are, are not using Facebook anymore. Many of them are gravitating to sites like WhatsApp and Kik, which allow for kind of unlimited texting. They also allow for social networking. They've got uh, their own search engines embedded. But there are these constantly new places for them to inhabit, and there's a feeling that they've got to kind of keep up everywhere. And that also then takes away from the time that they would have to develop relationships that are more complex. They also are dealing with, or we are dealing with now, a time where there's kind of no sense of moderated intimacy. In the past, I would, if we were going to create a relationship, I would disclose a little bit to you. I would find out based on how you handled that disclosure if you were trustworthy or not. And then I would make commensurate decisions about what else to share with you and we would kind of go in this back and forth way. Now, Many of you, probably before you decided to give time to this, Googled me, you know, and, and wanted to find out what you could find out there. You can find out a lot about people before you ever meet them. And so there's this sense that you have all this information, but no commensurate kind of experience to go with that or way to know how to go deeper. This also is hit on by the sense of decreased empathy because, again, we are not developing the self in the same way. We also aren't developing empathic connections in the same way. I believe that's largely because in so many of our digital spaces, we live in a way in which we objectify others um, more than we live in a way in which we encounter others. So many of our uh, digital spaces are about judging people. So there's hot or not. There's um, there's rate my professor where you can go in and choose your professor based on easiness and hotness. So, you know, but we are constantly rating and evaluating. Same thing with you know, our experiences. We don't go to a restaurant unless we yelp it first. You know? um, and so we, we have these moderated experiences and relationally this plays itself out in that we can shop for whatever we want relationally. So rather than having to kind of go through the tricky part of developing that, which creates this sturdy foundation, we just shop for the little pieces we want. This is seen by things like Cuddler is, the, is a new app where it works on GPS where you can sign up for, with an account and you can find people within your local geographic area to cuddle with. Um, and you can find apps of all kind, you know, people to eat dinner with, people to have a conversation with. Uh, the, 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 king or queen of this is, is Tinder, where um, you, you, know, you register for a profile and it use it, the Tinder accesses your contacts in your computer or your phone and finds people that you have in common with other people and then feeds you a never-ending kind of stream of images that if you like the look of, you swipe right, and if you don't like the look of, you swipe left. But it creates this kind of deep sense of... Um, what am I shopping for? What is the most important thing? How can I get it most efficiently? Again, looking for how can, I be, how can this be the most convenient um, experience I can have? Rather, and that, that, that always, anytime we are shopping for relational experience, it tends to lead us to objectify. We also, and, and, and then psychologically, we now are in a world where the media is constantly feeding us these kind of objectified images of both men and women that are just profound in the way in which they, they speak to us. You know, if you, that was the, the image I just showed you is from the Super Bowl this year. And if you think about just what children experience in the advertising and media right now about how we look at people. It is typically how we look at them for what they can give us or what they can create in us. Um, this goes right back to porn. This is a, a pretty popular saying um, 
you know, if there is a reality, so if something exists, there's porn of it. There's porn of baking cookies, there's porn of vacuuming, there's porn of you know, whatever. But again, it, this just speaks to the fact that we can objectify, we can sexualize, we can do whatever, we can violence, we, we, can, we can create these experiences that are having a profound effect. I would encourage everyone to look, to read this interview by John Mayer. You can access it online. It was published in, in the New York Magazine. Um, and it just, it really talks about the relational impact that is, that is being had uh, by, by, especially by porn and the objectification that it creates across gender and across age groups. Um, you can also look at, there's a new website called stopthenewdrug.org that it has some very profound tools and help um, in terms of the relational impact that is kind of being seen now in the literature. Um, Another thing that we need to know about is that all of the relational aggression that is so easily acted out in digital spaces is also creating a tricky situation where young adults and kids are, have a harder time being authentic selves in public because they know it can be publicized all the time. Everyone's got a camera now, right? and everyone can, can publish anything wherever they want. Nowhere is this seen more than in revenge porn sites, so there are sites where, you know, so if, if anyone works with young adults or um, especially high school students, I would encourage you to read the Atlantic, no, the, it will come to me, it's a, a cover story, yeah, the Atlantic Monthly on sexting. Sexting is, an, is, is a norm now. It's kind of like y if you breathe, you sext if you're in high school, meaning you take naked pictures of yourself and send them to someone. These are then very frequently stored and can be used later um, to kind of bully someone. And so because kids know that this is such a preponderance and, and, and just common sense activity anymore, it's harder for them to be authentic and to be willing to kind of reveal themselves in ways that are risk-taking that will develop meaningful relationships because they know it could come back to bite them anytime. In a lot of parts of the world, revenge porn is becoming illegal and that's important for you to know. So, re so revenge porn is basically someone can take an image that they got of someone else if they want to bully them and, and pay five to ten dollars and send that image to one of these sites and that site will send it out to, you know, will make it viral, basically. Um, and it's, be, it's, it's kind of a new trend legally. Um, another thing relationally that we just need, we need to know about is that um, this kind of sense of, of uh, violence in, in so much of our media is really tweaking the way in which individuals, and, so, and especially individuals who consume a lot of violent media, kind of um, interact with folks on average. So again, if we think about the way in which this endocrine system, the neurological system, and then just the psychological reality that if we are kind of exposing ourselves to high levels of violence when we are out and about in the world, it's, it's easier to mistreat people, it's easier to be sarcastic with them and to be off-putting, and that is showing itself in the literature relationally as well. So interventions. It's really important to keep your, your kind of interpersonal skills in tune and to encourage them in other people. So when you go out and about in the world to sometimes not have your phone out and to intentionally be looking people in the eye, to be having meaningful conversations with them, to sometimes have conversations with people about something and sometimes conversations about nothing. If you talk to individuals who interview young adults now, they will tell you young adults don't maintain the same ability to schmooze anymore. They can't talk about the piece of art in the professor's office office or you know it's it's just not they don't have the opportunities so giving people those opportunities and um, watch the way you you talk about and, tr and treat others you know now especially the, the so much of our communication happens in these spaces that can be watched we are being watched so make sure that your example is one of beauty and grace um, examining how you feel when you use social networks a preponderance of individuals, when they use uh, things like Facebook, things like um, WhatsApp, show me, um, they oftentimes feel insecure or uh, unhappy with their own lives after they spend time there. And if that is the case for you, don't use them. Find other ways of being connected and be countercultural in a way that can actually speak out to others. Um, I also would encourage you to really be mindful of the platforms that you use and the way in which they might objectify people 
or the way in which they could create kind of um, attachment to forms of stimulation for other people even that could be very difficult and hard to overcome. And then talk about all forms of relational aggression. I think there is so much hope and, and especially if you look at some of the research around mindfulness practices, um, the research around all different forms of mental health and healing, there are ways that we can kind of help individuals create um, new uh, richness and depth in their own personal experiences and relational experiences. One of the things that I have found in this last several months on college campuses um, is that I've had on each college campus I've been on, and I've probably been at six or seven since September, I've had at least one individual and sometimes more come to me who, who play Grand Theft Auto V. And it last, the end of last summer, uh, a new hack came out for Grand Theft Auto V that you can apply to the game that allows you to rape within the game. And it is largely downloaded. And um, individuals who have downloaded that hack and are using it at, at every one of these campuses, at least one person has come and said, I'm now having breakthrough like rape dreams. They don't want to be having these. <laughs> they do not want these images in their mind. I, I feel like a lot of us don't want the experiences of rejection that we have online or the things we catch ourselves being gravitated toward. Uh, gambling is another huge issue with online issues, you know, people who get sucked in there. There are all kinds of ways in which we can help people overcome these uh, kind of unconscious breakthrough difficulties and painful experiences. And so we need to motivate and be kind of beacons, I believe. I want to inspire you all to be beacons of hopefulness about being able to have embodied experiences that will overcome the difficult ones that, that our digital spaces have created. So now we're going to just transition now that maybe everybody's feeling totally hopeless and like we, we, there is no hope. I feel a ton of hope. I am actually really, really excited. I love where some forms of technology are taking us and I love some of the beautiful things about it, that it can attach us to people that we would never be attached to, that it can bring us information we would never otherwise have access to. But I also want to, more than anything, encourage us to think about the ways in which we have been been habituated and for many of us that's been that we want to take the best parts of technology and act like the other parts don't exist you know or act like ah, it's no problem we want to kind of just it, my use is fine so everybody's use must be fine and that's just not true so I want us to be able to take this information that you've now been given and not be fearful so a lot of parents after they come to one of my talks will feel like they want to take all the devices and you know throw them out the window or unplug everything and that's just not realistic uh, but I do think we can just take some of this information in and begin to kind of embody compassion and grace and empathy and think about how even we ourselves are prone to uh, dismissing the negative impacts of our own use and um, kind of hyper, hyper thinking we're all good. Uh, in a couple of weeks when the new Apple Watch comes out, I am guessing that a lot of people who have been critical of their own kids' technology dependence are going to suddenly not be thinking about that while they're standing in line at the Apple store waiting to get their Apple Watch, you know? <laughs> and we need to kind of own that. The first thing that, the first way in which we can own that and break some of our habits is by what I think of as, as employing the technology pyramid. So when I first started doing these talks about 10 years ago, um, I was really bummed out, you know, by all the, the terrible news 10 years ago, um, <laughs> which was nothing like the terrible news now. Um, um, and I, I, I took this time to like, oh, I want to kind of refresh and just like clean my palate. So I got out Old Life magazines and started looking at all these Old Life magazines, right? And within about 10 minutes, I was like on a rant, which I'm sure you can all tell I easily do. Um, but basically, in these Life magazines from the 50s, what I was finding is that every other advertisement was either for convenience foods or cigarettes. And, um, and I was thinking about how, okay, so in the 50s, in, the, in America, we're post-war America, we're not having to kind of ration in the way we used to, and, and, and we've got these new convenience foods that are pumped full of salt and amazing fake flavors <laughs> that were intended, I think, to probably be side dishes, accompaniments, right? But if you look at the literature, especially the health literature, about 20 years later, we suddenly see hypertension, high cholesterol, obesity, all these issues that are related in part to the way in which we eat in the West. Now, what, is, what, did, our, what did we do as a, res, as a response? We created the food pyramid, right? Which says, you know, eat 
more of these good foods for you and fewer of these foods that will hurt you. And that has solved all the problems in the West, right? We have no hypertension, no obesity. It has not solved any problems. Um, it has maybe solved a couple problems, I don't know. But, but basically, we created this, this kind of movement toward we want the more tasty, the more easy. We want to be convenient and we want to be comfortable and we want to, you know, just have everything be great. And so we began to take this thing, these foods that were supposed to be accompaniments and made them main dishes and they ended up hurting us. I feel the same way with technology, that it, it, it can be a beautiful accompaniment to an embodied life. It can provide us with fantastic things if we use it well, but it can also, and I think it c will be, and I think we're starting to see this in the literature now, this, this research out of University of um, Waterloo, I feel like is is kind of proving this, that if we keep consuming it at this level, it will have profound effects that will be hard for us to dial back on. So this is the technology pyramid that I use with clients and families. And we want to, to consider using technologies more that connect people. So things like FaceTime, like, like Skype, like, you know, in, in the classroom, if we're using those technologies that engage embodied people to embodied people, those are going to be the helpful technologies to connect us. Technologies that educate people with a growth mindset. So I want to tell you the difference between growth and fixed mindset. Carol Dweck is the researcher who is kind of leading this movement. She's out of Stanford, and she is a psychologist, and she feels like Stanford hurt the world when they released the Stanford Binet Intelligence Test, <laughs> which long ago, which kind of basically was one of those early tests that said, if you get, you know, if you attain this score, you are smart. That is a fixed mindset. Most of the educational system in the U.S. is built on a fixed mindset, saying if you attain this level, you are smart. If you think about it, many of our digital spaces live in this reality as well. Gaming systems, if you, you, know, if you do these things, you get to the next level. Uh, in Facebook, if you get to a thousand friends, you know, we give you oodles of more interesting information. I don't know. Um, but, but basically, this fixed mindset says, I, I have to attain this level that is arbitrarily set for me. The problem with gamification of so many things is that gamification oftentimes works on that fixed mindset model. And that is very discouraging and it does not create complexity in the brain. A growth mindset is the kind of mindset that says taking risks is what makes me smart. Having an ability to fail and, and handle that resiliently. Having an ability to try new things that might that give me access to new and deeper information. The growth mindset model individuals show a lot more complexity in their lifestyles and also, I mean, I'm sorry, in their life kind of engagement and depth of their experience. So we want to use technologies that kind of validate and reinforce a growth mindset model. Um, Minecraft is a fantastic example of, of, a, of a game that works on a growth mindset model. It uses real physics properties, like if you build something in mindset that would not live up to snuff in the physical world, it doesn't live up to snuff in the digital world, um, but it, it creates encouragement for trying it, like way to go, you know, and, and try it in this new way. So you're going to want to engage those more. Above that are the technologies that entertain. I am constantly encouraging people, do not let your soul forms of entertainment be digital. Make sure you engage your body in some forms of entertainment. And then when you do use technology to entertain you, try to watch out for or make sure that you aren't only engaging with technologies that, that kind of either um, kind of romanticize violence or sexualization or that are solely built on monetization because those are technologies that are going to grab your attention and not really build you. It, it would be kind of like if you ate cotton candy for the rest of your life. You, know? you, you want some substance. So making sure you're evaluating that. And then the technologies that actually can hurt people, that violent and highly sexualized and especially violent sexualized, if you put those two together, content needs to be used sparingly. Kind of like on the food pyramid, there's no place for cyanide because any amount of it will kill you. <laughs> I believe that there are some things for some people especially that will kill their psychological selves, um, you know, if they're engaged with too much and we just need to be aware of that. My favorite site, um, and I receive nothing from them from promoting them. Uh, they know they don't know I promote them. Is commonsensemedia.org. This is a fantastic 
fantastic group of people who dedicates their life and professional practice to reviewing all forms and platforms of media. And the other great thing I love about Common Sense Media is that you can go on at any time and get a review of any game, any movie. If you are a mental health worker and your client comes in and says, I can't get off Grand Theft Auto 5. And you say, okay, what do you love about Grand Theft Auto 5? And they say, I love the strategy and I love the visuals. Then you can go into commonsensemedia.org and find a similar kind of strategic game with high, highly dense visuals and, and make some good suggestions in that way. So this is a fantastic site. This site also has a great um, free uh, digital literacy program that families and educators can use to teach really sound and good digital literacy. This is also a site that I love to suggest people check out. Um, this is emergent.com and it's out of the Tau Center for uh, Digital Journalism at Columbia University. And basically you can type in any news story or you know you probably all have somebody in your life who forwards you sensationalist emails about these things that are for sure really truly happening right um, this is kind of like the the, the more um, academically sound snopes so you can you can type it in here and they will either tell you if a story is verified or unverified but it's a really great place to just check your information before you um yeah before you repeat it this is the, the, the way in which I have come to think about assessing digital use and our reliance upon technology. And I actually encourage people to do this for themselves and to do this with others. I would take a piece of paper in landscape mode and write across the top each of these five areas and then just assess under them, maybe with a five point scale, how you're doing in each of these areas. And it, it goes with an ABC little T at the end because you just have to add a weird letter, but, but if you just go A, A, B, C, D, T, and you memorize this, A, A, B, C, D, T, I felt like I had really arrived at a college campus recently. People started tweeting with the hashtag A, A, B, C, D, T, and I felt like I, this was the, fantastic. Um, but basically, I'll teach you what this is. So this, this A just stands for an ability to FDR, and that's that focus, delay, and regulate. Those, again, are the three constructs that are really, really on the decline and that are having a profound effect across all those domains. So what is my ability to focus on one thing for 10 minutes and maintain that focus? What is my ability to delay? Can I, can I wait on an impulse thought or feeling? And then can I regulate those impulses, thoughts, and feelings, moder moderate them? AB has to do with attachment balance. And this has to do with what is the balance of my attachments in digital spaces versus in embodied spaces? So we want to make sure that there is a balance there. If it is only in digital spaces, probably are gonna need to do some habit breaking there and some discomfort of detaching a little bit from some of those over attachments, soothing the self, and then learning to attach in some embodied spaces. It's really important. C, this finger in many cultures, if you hold it up by itself, can get you in a lot of trouble. This is the content and context kind of assessment area. This one is huge. So, so the thing that everybody, or not everybody, but one of the more common questions I get asked is how much time should kids spend online or how much time should I be spending online? Time does not really matter in and of itself. But in relation to these other elements, especially this one, it's important. So if all of the content that you are consuming is fluff or is at the top of the technology pyramid or is fixed mindset model or is highly sexualized or highly violent, probably want to be aware that that's not going to be having the most amazing impact on your interpersonal experience, on your own thought kind of process, and on, on your physiology. Similarly with context, if you are using your devices, if you're pretty attached to your device and you only use it in isolation, that means that you are not having as much social practice family talk time. So you want to be aware of context and content. These are really important and again have a lot to do with how much time. D, this in a lot of cultures has to do with a, 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 this is a ring finger in many cultures where you show your devotion to something. This is just to remind you to think about what is your devotion to your device? Um, you know, right now just stop and consider, do you know more than two phone numbers by memory? This used to be our, our kind of assessment for early onset dementia. 
<laughs> and anymore, hardly anyone knows any phone numbers because they're all stored for you. Um, how many of you can get someplace without your GPS? You know, and how many places can you get? Or would you know how to make your way to a place without your GPS? Are you willing to, to try something out without reading all the reviews? Uh, but you know, what is your level of devotion? And if you find that you are highly devoted to your device and unlikely to do without it for a period of time, it's probably important that you force yourself to try and see what that experience is like. And then finally, time. Time, again, is only relevant in relation to all of those other domains. Um, if you are spending 10 minutes with, you know, raping people in Grand Theft Auto V, that's probably too long. Um, if you are spending 10 hours online trying to cure Ebola, that's probably not enough. So again, that only really matters in here. I will tell you a couple of things. Probably many of you saw the... Um, Research, or not the research, but the article that came out by Steve Jobs' uh, kids that talked about the fact that he, that in their house, they were limited to 30 minutes of screen time a day. Same for Bill and Melinda Gates' kids. Another interesting dynamic that I find is that in the Silicon Valley, where a lot of app development happens, Waldorf school waiting lists are profoundly long and in the Waldorf school movement they use no technology in the classroom so the individuals who are developing all this technology for us are wanting their children educated in a system that doesn't rely upon technology and I think that's telling and we should be aware of that um, the next thing that I think is so crucially important and the thing that I may be the most excited to share with you today is that if we can just teach self-soothing if we ourselves can embody an ability to be still and bored and um, sturdy in that stillness. We will have a profound impact on our own experience, on our own actually neurological function, and hopefully inspire that in others. Research out of Stanford and uh, Mass General in Boston has been well reviewed, well constructed, and basically showed that 10 minutes a day of mindfulness meditation, which looks a lot like also, um, if, you, if you look at the literature on mindfulness meditation, it looks a lot like contemplative prayer. It also has a lot of similarities to rhythmic exercise, the forms of exercise that get you in a zone where you're kind of not fully um, thinking about something, but you're very fully present. 10 minutes of that a day for six months doubled the gray matter in the part of the brain relating to emotional regulation and self-control. That is profound. So if you think about it, the research on focus is saying that we can no longer focus for 10 minutes. In fact, in the US, I, I don't have the exact statistic, but it's somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of internet users will, will go away from a website or a screen image if it doesn't load in two seconds two seconds. We cannot even wait for something for two seconds. <laughs> so if we, if we can't do that, and if 10 minutes has become our measure of a really, you know, adept ability to focus, think about if you harness that in this profound way, and if you practice that for six months, you are undoing some of the negative impact on your brain. That is just deeply profound. One of the things that I've found is the more that I have talked about this, um, people say that to me, I'm doing my 10 minutes, but I'm setting my timer on my phone to do my 10 minutes. So they're, you know, relying on that. So I'm telling people, find a way. I actually had these made. <laughs> I had these made and I chose the kindest creator of, of timers, 10 minute timers, because I couldn't find 10 minute timers anywhere. So I didn't want somebody who was, you know, just like treating their employees terribly. So I, I chose the kindest person, not the most precise. So they're actually like eight to 13 minute timers. <laughs> But they were made beautifully and kindly. Um, but to put things around your home or your office that remind you to actually turn away and that will, that will kind of force you. There isn't yet research that, that shows um, kind of at least substantially that that 10 minutes has to be all at once. There, uh, so it looks like you could actually accrue that 10 minutes in as small as three minute segments. But, but to do that every day 10 minutes is all, is profound, or to find a way to challenge yourself toward that. Um, I'm actually in April going to start a 30-day challenge where I'm challenging people to just put their phone down for 10 minutes and giving them instructions of how to do that. Because it's, it's easy, but we just don't think about it anymore. Another profound thing that, ha that we see a change in, if you look physiologically across um, 
across the human experience is we breathe in a different way. So, so we breathe most effectively when we fill the bottom half of our lungs, right? So when we do this deep diaphragmatic breathing. And most of us, however, over the age of two, have converted to this very shallow breathing that is all up in the chest. So even if we just do several minutes of this deep breathing, and I use Hoberman spheres, a friend of mine uses them as breathing balls, and I have copied her use of them, but you just, you expand it, and that means you expand the bottom half of the lungs while you breathe in, and then you let it drop down, so you kind of close it up. And this is a profound, again, reminder to put one of these on your desk, or put it out where you will see it to keep breathing. Out of the 12-step movement, we have this acronym. Um, this just basically stands for, and you can do this throughout your day, ask yourself, am I hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? Those are four instances that will drive you to kind of purposeless automatic behavior. For many of us, when we are these things, this is when we turn to screens. And oftentimes, if we would do a scan and quickly ask ourselves, what am I really hungry for? What am I angry about or agitated about? What am I lonely for? What am I tired? You know, why am I tired? And what will best revive me? <laughs> Rather than thinking I'm tired, I want to just space out to a movie. Um, these can really help us redirect our behavior and help become great message indicators for times that we need to, to build into ourselves. That same friend of mine, and this is just, these are all in the way of giving you ideas of how to kind of live these embodied lives um, that will be inspiring of other people to help them turn away from their screens. Same friend that uses the Hoberman spheres, uh, has this international business called Yoga Calm that is fantastic and I think she has come up with such a fantastic idea. She teaches boys who are struggling with ADHD how to breathe by doing Jedi camps. So if you think about it, they, they take their lightsabers and they go <laughs> right? It's like beautiful and then on the last day of camp they do it like real Jedis all in their mind. You know, because they can't take their lightsaber to class, because that would not work. Um, but, but, you know, again, if we can find these creative tools that can help people manage, you know, there's a huge debate going on globally between are we seeing an increase in ADHD because there's actually an increase in ADHD, or are our games and screens creating ADHD symptoms, or are we all just now um, evolving into having brains that function the way an ADHD brain functions? Literally, these are, these are huge debates right now happening globally. And I kind of am saying, I don't know where the research is going to fall, but what, what I do know is that we are all more distracted and functioning more like kind of ADHD feels in people's brains, like that constant changing and constant stimulation. So we all need to be really focused on developing these commensurate skills. Another, another great skill is just to learn to melt, so literally picturing your body as an ice cube and literally imagining it melting. So, so you imagine yourself getting heavier and warmer, you imagine drips dripping off your nose and your fingertips and just becoming, again, loose because our, our, our posture and our tendency with our screens is that we are constantly on this, we're alert, we're hyper alert at all times. Other thing I want to encourage is just setting norms. This is a picture that happened in my real living space. This is five people out, five computers out, right? <laughs> so think about breaking some of the habits that exist in your own spaces and instead creating some new norms like the timer goes off at a certain time and everybody puts their screens away and we all encounter each other or a basket at the door. Um, a great idea for families is to kind of start out as a family having some family accounts in these spaces where you've got people of different generations using the same account and engaging with other families so that you're also teaching literacy, you're also creating an intergenerational age mix because that's another thing that's happening is we are, we are kind of making our social connections less uh, diverse. We are we, we're more able to interact just with the people who are like us. So again, finding any way to create diversity. I, I encourage people to put their phones down on Friday for 10 minutes again and you just do this hands-free Friday to 10 minutes you decide something you're going to do every Friday that you could never do with your phone in your hands and, um, and, and try it out and, and, and use that as just a reminder. Then the other thing I, I want to just go into kind of, I'm going to give you these kind of um, 
just basic, my, my favorite, my top ways of living wild, rich, embodied lives and encouraging other people to do the same, that to, to realize that the only space for living these fiery, kind of interesting lives is not in digital spaces. That that can happen some there, but that there can also be these rich, rich realities that we learn and, and attain only from encountering our physical spaces and other people's physical spaces. And then after I give you or kind of explain this list, I'm just going to give you some examples that I have um, juried, kind of like an art show of, of inspirational ideas that you can um, either try or share with others. First thing I hope we all emerge from this time together and we go out from here and we engage people. We engage them not just via text or via Facebook, but we actually engage the person who you know, who we meet at the gas station later or the, the, per the person who serves us later, but that we actually listen to them and we talk to them and we look in their eyes and we put our phone away. Maybe we even put our phone in the trunk when we drive so we're not even tempted to look at it. I want to encourage you all to fail. You know, there are therapists now who, and I, I think they're brilliant and I think they're needed, but there are therapists, and uh, one in particular um, in, in Portland that I know, who he, he will take uh, young adults and adolescents who have lacked that family talk time and social practice, so who really gravitate toward digital relationships because they don't know how to have these embodied relationships anymore and they fear, you know, what will happen if I make a mistake and it's caught online or whatever. And he takes them with a, a coin purse full of coins and they go into a, a coffee shop and, and he has them on purpose spill all the coins onto the floor and then they have to gather them up and then they have to use them to go and look at the barista's eyes and order their coffee and use their coins to pay for it. But just to help them develop this social practice. We don't, we, I, I think it's great that they exist, but what if we all just invited people to be those authentic coin spilling, bumbling, not knowing how to order people? You know, what if we just lived in this way that invited kind of fiery authenticity. I want to I want to encourage us also maybe one of my most important points other than the 10 minutes is that it is important that we force ourselves to be inconvenienced and uncomfortable. Everything about the digital spaces says let's make things more convenient, let's make you more comfortable. That does not make for interpersonal relatedness that is rich and deep and gutsy. Sometimes we just have to be inconvenienced and uncomfortable. And, and life is not going to just hand you those opportunities anymore. So you might have to create them. You might actually have to force yourself. And I, I think it's so worth it. Force yourself sometimes also to focus. There's really interesting research in the six hour version of this talk that I get into um, about reading on a screen versus reading on paper. There is a huge difference neurologically and experientially that is starting to show itself in the literature. I can't go into that right now, uh, but, but I will tell you every once in a while, force yourself to focus on paper. It is very, very important. And, or force yourself to focus on Force yourself to focus on the clouds changing in the sky. I mean, whatever. But just sometimes force yourself to learn to scan out the rest of the environment and be directly focused. Learn to live within boundaries and limits. Um, if you ask an individual who smokes if it would be easier to try to stop smoking or never start, they will tell you never start. Uh, we have all started using technology, probably. So thinking through what are the norms you wish you would have put in place for yourself. Um, if you have a hard time getting at that, think about the person that annoys you with their cell phone the most and think about what, what norms and parameters you wish they would have and that will help you ascertain what you will like to have for yourself as well. Sometimes it's, we're, we're very bad and the research bears this out, we're very bad at estimating our own engagement with technology. Most people, at least in the U.S., say, yeah, technology is a real issue for other people. <laughs> we're very, we're very um, reticent to own our own. Um, tricky spots with it. I think if we can invite interaction with all kinds of people and places and experiences, the more myopically focused we get, the less inviting of um, the kind of peaceful and interesting and diverse world that would be beautiful to live in. So making sure that you are really having this rich experience with all kinds of people. And then living rich embodied lives. These are just some experiences that I have come to um, use and, and want to share with you and you can inspire other people with them or try them at home. Put a puzzle out. 
Put a puzzle out in your waiting room. Put a puzzle out in the cafeteria. Put a puzzle out at your home. And just leave it there. You know, we, we're, we're, we all abide having technology out now, but we don't have hand held things out anymore. Um, oftentimes on college campuses I will host what I call procrastination stations or powered off zones where people leave their phone at the entrance of the area and I just bring board games and magazines and yarn and glue. One of the most popular things over the last three years that I have seen happen is that the white Elmer's glue goes like crazy before anything else and students love to paint it on their hands and then blow on it and peel it off slowly, which is a very visceral and kinesthetic experience. Experience. and it takes about 10 minutes for it to dry so I've learned that's an awesome 10 minute mindfulness experience but literally these simple things that again get you experientially back in your body put the screen away for a little while and get out toys you know these are just Legos these are things I have out and about in my house Legos or shape blocks that are used for math teaching you can get these at, at educational stores these are fantastic also for focus for individuals who are really left-brained and linear and logical if you put these in a bowl they will love to make kind of mandala shapes with them and it will help them really focus and it will help them as attain 10 minutes of silence better than anything else this is kinetic sand one of my favorite things have a bowl of kinetic sand it's fantastic it doesn't make a mess I, everyone should have a bowl of this I am not kidding you um, it's called kinetic sand, some, t some places it's called moon sand, um, but it's sand with a little polymer and it, 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 it is profoundly comforting and, and sensual in a way that kind of, and, and it, it makes your hands busy so you have to put your phone away. Another product like that is Crazy Aaron's Thinking Putty, it's almost, it's very similar to, to Silly Putty. This, is, this and the kinetic sand are the two things that are played with most at my house and in my office. Um, this is just this amazing putty that it will get you through, those of you who are learning online and having to sit in front of a computer screen especially, having something that you can just play with and manipulate is really important. Luna sticks are great, They're any, uh, if you talk to neurologists they say that they would like everybody in the world, everyone's brains would be enhanced by if they juggled, uh, played the drums or played ping pong, table tennis. Um, this is kind of a way of doing juggling, you know, so it's anything that crosses the midline and gets your body active in focusing and also in moving back and forth up and down is going to be profoundly impactful for your kind of your level of contentment, your ability to soothe and also your neurological functioning. Uh, I encourage you to put a pull up bar in your house and challenge people to do crazy things with it. Uh, this is just a talent show that a family had together that you can again instead of watching YouTube or say for every YouTube you watch you have to come, come up with one skit that you have to perform for us. Baking and cooking parties where you just provide all the materials and people just come and cook. Letting kids have the experience of, of actually doing something that feels grown up. So my brother let his kids, you know, they can light their own candles and matches and carry them upstairs if they're going to make their mom and dad breakfast in bed. So that's what this is, you know, like you can have this wild experience of actually carrying candles um, and, and suddenly getting the iPad out in the morning isn't so exciting when you can have this you know fun experience of creating all by yourself without mom and dad creating spaces where people can do embodied things this is this is my bathroom um, it, you can write on the walls and the ceiling <laughs> um, so just again creating unique spaces where people can create getting old supplies and letting people paint makers fairs are all the rage in the US I have not been able to find if they have a global presence but this is uh, makers fairs are basically a uh, spaces where people who know how to make something come and they, they now on the east and west coast there's actually one of the biggest ones was in Los Angeles last year and then the other one was in New York but individuals who can make something come and then individuals who want to learn how to make something come and then they all switch up so maybe you'll go to one workshop where you learn how to make a 3d printer and then the next workshop you go to you learn how to make a story and then the next one you teach how to bake a pie but literally to create within your own community something like a makers fair could also be very interesting and unique Letting, if you have a family that's musical, making a little band or, you know, and playing out on the street or encouraging the playing of interesting and unique instruments is really, really important. Music gets to the brain in a really fascinating way. If, you're, if your community is stuck on watching Dancing with the Stars, take some dance lessons, get off the screen and do it. Host a theme party, this was a reading rainbow party, or host a party where you have temporary tattoos. Everyone in the world will love it. Uh, get your body going. Rock climbing is a really unique experience. It can create for individuals uh, that sense of that 10 minutes of calm. So anything that is strategic and allows for you to kind of be solving problems but not be so caught up in kind of rational thought will also help. Um, 
using, using things like henna to create um, kind of intergenerational connections with people where touch and talk is involved. Uh, going to international markets that force people to be in unique experiences. And then one of my favorite hints from someone recently was if you want your family members to be off of their devices when you're together, eat food that requires you to use your hands. Like <laughs> make your hands really sloppy, messy, no one will be on their phone. Um, play games out in public, go to live theater, uh, you know, go to things like comedy sports has a global presence and is fantastic and is improvisational and on the spot and intergenerational. Do geocaching. Um, or maybe one of my favorite, two favorite hints are, are things like ice blocking. Get a big block of ice, go to a place with hill with intergenerational bunch of folks and slide down the hills. You know, just again, screens aren't so exciting if we, if we are willing to be inconvenienced and uncomfortable and embodied. My favorite uh, thing Thing for for parents with sleep kids with sleepovers now you know all they want to do is watch screens and they're all on their devices right so I say you know you can be on your devices for 30 minutes and then the rest of the night I will take you to any teacher or administrator's house and you can sidewalk talk their driveway and street till the cows come home you know but again having these rich and wild embodied lives rather than thinking that the only places we can have richness and depth are, in, are online is really important to developing that strong sense of self to being able to tolerate the differences of others and have rich relational depth and then also to have this complex crazy ability to handle and wrestle with difficult information and internalize it brain and a body that's working beautifully and that is fully invaded. So this is the gift I have for you today. Um, these are the ways that you can reach me. Uh, on my Facebook page I put all of the research. So any piece of research that I review I put on Facebook right away so that you can have access to the actual studies. Um, my website has access to the vid a lot of the videos I, that I did not get to show because this platform is not particularly conducive to showing videos. Most of them are linked on my website. And then also if you're interested in that 30-day embodied challenge or I'm just going to send out 10-minute challenges, I think you can probably get to that hopefully through my, I don't know. <laughs> You'll get to it somehow on Facebook, maybe. I know it's on Facebook for sure, but I, I, I'll be tweeting about it too. Um, so now I think we move into questions and answers, and I'm not sure how that works. I'll Yay, thank you. I'll start with some uh, questions from the uh, virtual audience and give the in-person crowd here a chance to gather their <laughs> thoughts. Uh, lots of questions coming in. Um, I guess I'll start with this. As a parent or as a therapist, uh, you, you mentioned today so many different uh, uh, digital spaces that if, I'm sure during the course of this presentation, several more have, have emerged. You, you mentioned uh, common sense media. Are there any other places, wh where can therapists and parents go to know what they're up against? What, or, or their, their children or their clients are, are mm -hmm. dealing with? How can you keep up with it all? You mentioned common sense media. Are there other places where you can um, keep abreast? Yes, so uh, common sense media is the most up-to-date and the most, um, they constantly are updating, so I really like them. I also maintain on my website, on the resources link, I maintain a list of other um, digital literacy, uh, anti-cyberbullying campaigns. Um, so I try to maintain a list there. Um, but, but really, of all of the resources out there, it, it is constantly changing and evolving. And um, I, I, well, I, I actually would say one other thing. As a th if you're a therapist, I actually include this in my intake now. So I am screening in my intake for what kinds of platforms people are using, and then I'm keeping track of that not only for that particular client, but I'm also listening with an ear toward where, where people are invading spaces. I also think that you have to talk to and listen to your kids um, and create an empathic response. So many kids and young adults, and this happens with clients as well, are afraid to tell you where they're spending their time in digital spaces because they're afraid of judgment or punishment or discipline. And I think if we create an openness, then we will learn because it's very regional. That's the other tricky thing. Um, what, what is gonna be good information for a parent in Kansas is gonna be very different than good information for a parent in California. So a lot of it has to be reliant upon you creating connections with folks who, who know that you are a safe person and they can tell you where they're spending time and then you can go do the research about, about that. That's what I think I would say now. You'd mentioned uh uh, neurological pruning and other uh, 
ways that uh, this can have uh, negative impacts on, 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 on the brain. Um, lots of questions coming in on how, how resilient the brains are and how this compares to other, uh, other things that impact, you know, uh, uh, we know that different substances affect the brains kind of, and they'll affect the brains neurologically, but some have a more devastating impact than others. Where does this kind of rank? And then the other question, I just lost completely. Let me just leave it at that. Okay. I, I would direct everyone to the, to the research out of the uh, uh, University of Waterloo again, because yes, many, many substances, many experience, every experience um, has an impact on the brain. And, um, and this is just one more of them. The issue for me, in, in, and again, I'm spending a huge bulk of my time researching this, and this really comes out in that University of Waterloo research, is that humans tend to be terrible about requiring discomfort of themselves. <laughs> they, humans tend to gravitate toward wanting experiences that, that provide them with ease and that provide them with comfort. And our technological advances are providing that to us in such a way that it is having, we, we don't have self-control with it and so it is constantly taking up more and more of our time and where we are spending our time is how our brain is developing. So it has a little bit of a more profound effect because of the snowball effect of the amount of time we are immersed in it. Um, so I, I do things a little different and I would, I would, I think the best answer of that is going to be found in that University of Waterloo research, which is all over the press right now, yesterday and today, so you can find it. And it just really is talking about how we do gravitate and how, um, humans over time will always, well, will frequently choose the easier option and how technology is geared toward giving us the easier option. And that, that the, the biggest place of impact is our brain. And just to, the, the, the other aspect of the question that alluded me there for a second was how, uh, how is the, the brain able to reboot at all? Uh. If, if it's, because we can't escape technology completely, yeah. there's, and there's technology that uh, does wonderful things, as you pointed out, does the exposure to the good technology uh, get in the way of your brain kind of re structuring if that's the correct right term. I would I would direct folks to the research by Daniel Siegel and the folks at um, UCLA uh, on that topic uh, both the book the whole brain child and the book mind sight really are, are my two favorite resources regarding neuroplasticity the brain is incredibly incredibly um, plastic it, it, it's constantly trying to heal itself um, Martin Deutsch the brain that heals itself is also a fantastic resource um, so I, I think there is great hope. The thing that I would say, I think there's great hope as long as we maintain or begin to set a norm for moderation. Because again, while the, the, there is great research that shows that uh, collaboration and creativity in digital spaces increases our ability to be collaborative and creative in digital spaces. So it's kind of like saying, I'm a really good smoker because I smoke a lot. So I'm really good at being creative and being collaborative in digital spaces because I do it a lot. So that, there's no qualitative comment there. Um, because of that, I, I, I think there's a tendency to say, since this is where we get all of our goodness from, let's build our brains there too. So that's where all these brain training programs are coming in online and stuff. That's okay, but making sure that we maintain this well-balanced approach because there is a difference interpersonal neurobiology will tell you there is a difference in how the brain reacts to embodied person to embodied person connection than how it reacts to digital connections. Lots of questions in this, uh, centering around this point as well. Uh, a characteristic about the digital age is that geographical boundaries are kind of disappearing. You can uh, do business, you can e-commerce exist across uh, borders, you can associate with friends from around the world, and you can, uh, you can even work uh, uh, remotely. Uh, psychology, licensure, that's all about boundaries. Uh, where do you see, where do you see, uh, uh, whether it's teletherapy or e-therapy, how do you see that evolving given this, the current state of licensure and just what, what, what's your vision? That's a great question. Um, I, would, I would refer these folks, if you're interested in that, to the APA.org. They are really working on setting kind of the norms and parameters around that, at least for psychologists. And I know the different licensing bodies um, are working on that. I think one of the beauties about some of our forms of FaceTime and Skype are that people who would not normally have access to high quality kind of mental health 
care or even health care sometimes have access to it. I do think that we have to be aware at, this, at the same time that I say that, I'm also aware of a growing movement, at least in the US, there is a small but growing movement of therapists who are providing therapy via text. Um, and I think I wanna be really aware of how that deeply, you know, the disembodied words are very different than embodied even voice communication. You lose so many um, aspects. So I think it's, it has beautiful, hopeful realities and it has very difficult ones and it is <laughs> uber super complex. And I'm gonna have to refer and defer to folks like the APA who are trying to figure that out. Here, I'll ask uh, another and then turn to the in-person audience. If, if if governmental organizations like the uh, FDA and the FTC exist to protect us against bad things we might eat and uh, bad things we might uh, be susceptible to buy or, or advertising practices, uh, when are we going to have some sort of a federal technology association or something to, uh, or do you see that happening? Where do you? Sadly, an untouchable area. Sadly, I do not see that happening. In fact, I see the opposite happening. So. Um, for instance, in the U.S., I don't, probably many of you have noticed in, in theaters, there used to be, before a movie, you would see a preview for another movie. Now we see previews for video games. I don't know if you've noticed this, but this, this is something that's happening. And the, actually, the FTC historically has had to give ratings to those video, or to the movie trailers before a movie. So you can only show a trailer for a G-rated movie at a G-rated movie, for instance. The video game uh, lobby has somehow made it such that they don't have to comply with those same green band trailers. So you can show a very violent or very adult game trailer before a children's movie. And so I, I actually see the opposite happening in terms of right now. I think that technology is advancing so quickly. Most corporations now have neural marketing departments that are actually using real-time brain scans while p individuals are watching ads to try to, you know, lengthen the parts of the ad that, that excite the desire parts of the brain and shorten the parts of the ad that excite the rational, you know, decision-making parts of the brain. So I think at this point I, I see it going the opposite direction and I hope I hope that we will have some care, but until then, I just am deeply inspired to start my own little mini movement. <laughs> and hope that we can all do the work that isn't happening for us. <laughs> I was just wondering, you've given us a, a bounty of important information. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but what would you say is maybe one or two of the most important implications for clinicians? How can we incorporate this into our practices to support our efforts to help our clients? I love that question. So the first thing I would say is that we have to start asking about it. I, when I encounter therapists, I have yet to encounter very many therapists that are asking in intake or in ongoing ways about the space that their clients are spending 12 and a half hours a day in. And, and so I, I, that's just profound to me. <laughs> like, you know, we are living a lot of our lives there. We are having a lot of our experiences there. So the first thing I just feel like we have to start asking the questions and then being willing to kind of consistently be, if, if this is a growing part of our clients' uh, real lives, consistently asking them, how is this a part of their real lives? You know, we ask them about their drug use, we ask them about their sexual realities, their religious practices sometimes, we ask them about all kinds of things and the way in which they shape and form them and either help or hurt them. This is a primary place of help, hurt that, that is untapped. So, so the first thing would be to ask about it. I ask about it on intake and I ask consistently. I think a second thing that we can do is set really intentional norms. A lot of therapists right now that I'm encountering across at least the US are having a hard time because they have, without really intentionally thinking about it, let things like texting and email kind of enter into their practice. And now, now they're suddenly seeing really potent clinical issues coming through an email or texting and they have not set any norms or boundaries around that, so they're finding themselves in real trouble. So be, being very thoughtful about the way in which they're going to engage the technologies themselves and the, the way in which that communicates. And then the third thing I would say is to, I think that we as therapists have this beautiful gift of being the holders of the beauty of embodied connection and how embodied connection can change people's experience. And 
undo hurts and undo traumas and, and actually even rewire the brain. We know that interpersonal neurobiology tells us that in-person experience. So if we could hold that role and, and model it beautifully and offer it authentically and deeply, I think we could change the world. So those are the three things I would say. Um, in working with uh, a kid with autism, you know, you hear a lot of stories about uh, disturbing comments, exchanges, things like that. From a parental standpoint, a mentor and then a therapist, is there a temptation to go into that medium and look at the comments? Is there an ethical boundary? Do you encourage it from mm. a parent standpoint or as a therapist to go into that medium to so like if your own child has has been bullied there right. you mean would it be worth seeing the content right and do you do that and then could it be beneficial that's a great question um that's a great question and also that brings up another thing that as a result of uh converting this to a shorter talk that I did not mention that I want to mention first of all. There are a few special populations who are going to be benefited from more time online. That also means that those individuals are likely going to experience more painful, potentially painful experiences online. Autistic individuals or individuals who exist on that spectrum, there are assistive technologies that help them immensely that are, you know, only exist in digital spaces. Um, also individuals who identify as gay, lesbian, bi, trans, I mean those folks are all going to have an opportunity to experiment and probably they're going to have some healthy experiences there. Um, so we need to be aware of that first. So the second thing is that is really, I think what I, that would be a case by case basis. I think I would be inclined if I were the parent of an individual who had had really a painful experience online that was also chronicled and libraried, you know, <laughs> kind of kept there. I think I would be inclined to engage a third party, a therapist, a teacher, um, someone in their community, their religious community, whatever, to, to kind of do some of the looking at that first and then help the parent know if it's going to be beneficial for them to look directly at that content or not. Oftentimes what can happen is parents can get so wrapped up in it that then the parent overreacts and loses their ability to be a good empathic container for the child. So I would be looking to, to maintain the parent's ability to be objective and, and present. Does that make, does that answer your question? Yeah, and I, you, you hear recently about, I don't know if you heard Kurt Schilling, the, the baseball player. No, I didn't. Or stories about Ashley Judd going after, you know, some of those. So you sort of find that balance of how do you approach That's right. some of those online presence. So. Yeah. It, the, the things, things that, that can happen in those spaces are really so painful. <laughs> they are so painful. And um, yeah, I, I think it's just, I, again, the more we can all be aware and, and loan ourselves out in those situations to help maintain loving presences for kids and, and adults, the better. I'd like to follow up on that question, because that seems like this has really emerged in the last just two or three weeks since that Kurt Schilling um, example where he, uh, his daughter posted a photo or something and, uh, on Twitter and was just uh, suffered horrible uh, abuse. And he, he looked up the people who had abused her and he, he got, uh, somebody was fired. He, he outed the bullies. Mm -hmm. And apparently that's, it's become a trend. It's happened in the last uh, 10 days. More and more people are aggressively outing bulliers online. And what do you, what are your thoughts? At some level, it's kind of satisfying, but it might, I mean, what do you So I'm, do I'm so glad. So, so now I know what happened. That helps me know. So this is actually a huge issue. So oftentimes, that is the, that's the parental um, impulse. It's the administrative impulse. It's certainly my impulse as a person who loves people. <laughs> the tricky thing is oftentimes then the child that has been bullied experiences a second round of really harsh reaction by their community. And that's what is really um, illuminated in the movie Death. Um, which I will come back to another thing as well. But um, so I would want to be working very closely with the child and saying, here are our options. We can reveal the bullier. We can go and talk to the school. You know, uh, I want you to be a part of the decision-making process about this to a point <laughs> because the child is probably likely always going to say, don't do anything about it. Don't, I'll just keep suffering. 
but I, I don't know that I would say, and this would also depend on the age of the child, and, uh, but, but I would want to be doing that along with the child because the second round of, of um, isolation and revenge uh, bullying that occurs as a result of being the narc is unbelievable and, largely, and will be driven even more underground because folks know that they are being watched. So um, that also, though, does remind me of one other thing that I did not say. If you want a really depressing but realistic view of kind of where culture is moving with technology, I would, there are three, no, three or four films I would recommend in addition to the death. One is Catfish. I would not, don't learn anything about it beforehand. Just watch it. It's, it's now been out for several years, and it's been shown to be accurate and true. Um, one is Her. So Her is about an individual who falls in love with his um, operating system. I think we are actually quite... That's a very accurate and telling film. Um, Don John is a film about the impact of porn, and I think it tells the story of this generation better than any other film. And then Robot and Frank. Robot and Frank kind of is the story of an individual who is um, aging and dealing with some early onset dementia, and his children uh, bring in a robot instead of a caregiver, and then he's faced with the difficulty uh, that his most intimate attachment is with this cyber being. It's, it's a very profoundly interesting and thought-provoking ethical uh, film about where we are. Yes. Okay, two-part question. I think we all can agree that technology has had a huge impact on our society. What findings have there, have there, have there, has there been uh, in what we see in other countries as opposed to the United States? Second part of that question is uh, the content of what we release in the United States in our television programming, music, and the like. You know, could it be that we are over emphasizing technology that perhaps we aren't seeing in other countries? I think that is absolutely true. I think there's a huge divide. Um, a lot of the research that uh, is coming out of the U.S. is replicated in countries like, or, or you can find replicating research in countries like the U.K. Um, Scandinavian countries are doing a lot of research uh, there, um, and, and their usage looks similar. But there, there is the great divide, and I think it's becoming greater and greater. And um, we don't have a realistic picture because not it, huge parts of the globe are still not connected digitally and are not seeing an impact. So I think we're very biased, and I, I'm sure I am very biased. So I appreciate that question. Thank you. Which is also why I want. I, it's another reason I feel passionate about us in the U.S. not going to a fully immersive digital educational experience for children. Because I want them to be able to encounter people who haven't had that experience and be able to connect with them and, and be embodied with them. Mm -hmm.